guess I should start the traditional way. Uh, peace be upon you. So that one. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about questions of theodicy, questions about the purpose of life, and what I experienced in that regard from reading the Quran the first time as an atheist. Right, I thought it was might interest. And uh, but in order to talk about that. By the way, my wife always says I should outline my talk before starting because I have a tendency to lose my audiences. So I thought I'd start by describing why I was an atheist because most people have a horrendous misunderstanding of atheism. And a lot of people think it's just motivated by hedonism or greed, you know, hedonism or arrogance or things like that. I think it's deeper than that very often. And so I would like to explain why I, I think I became an atheist and then I'd like to talk to you about uh, what I felt the Quran has to say about the existence of man and uh, uh, human humanity and our purpose. And I thought I'd present that against the backdrop of my first reading of the Quran. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I keep saying it does not make sense, but I teach math and math. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Well, how should I begin? I guess I'll begin with my mom. Uh, an homage to my mom. I like to say that she certainly wasn't the reason why I became an atheist. Uh, my mom was the most beautiful person. Uh, I know she's my mom, and I'm biased, but seriously, she was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful people I've ever known. If I try to think about that objectively, uh, she was a very devout Roman Catholic. She was not the type to live her religion on her sleeve, though. She wasn't the uh, you know, the type of how to push her faith or her religion on anyone else. But she just lived it day by day in her daily life through her actions. She was the most giving and charitable person I've ever known and never asked for any recognition in return. Really, she never, you know, she never really got it, never really wanted it. Uh, she used to work at, the, at 3030 Park Avenue in Bridgeport, Connecticut in a ward for the terminally ill. She was the head nurse on that ward. And uh, when I used to go and pick her up from work at the late night shift, I used to walk down the halls to find her and her patients, her uh, clients used to call me over to their bedside. Now these are people on their way out in life. And they used to call me over and tell me, uh, Jeff, your mother is the most wonderful, the most compassionate person I've met, many of them would say. Uh, I remember when she died, person after person came up to me and described my mom. They said, Jeff, your mother was a true saint. Um, she, like I said, she was extremely charitable. When she retired, and she retired because she became quite ill, she couldn't stay off her feet. She had to donate her time five days a week to work at the soup kitchen downtown, a very tough area of Bridgeport, feeding the poor. Uh, she never made a big deal about it. Just one more example, uh, when she died, I had to help my father with the accounts because my mother took care of that, and they didn't have much money. But just before she died, she had about $30,000 left in her checking account. That's all my parents had for their name. They had to sell their house because the medical bills were driving them on to ruin, I mean financial ruin, so they had to sell their house. And hopefully they were going to use some of that money. But in their bank account, they had $30,000 to her name. When she died, and about a week before she died, she wrote half of that. She wrote half of that, a check out for half of that to the soup kitchen. And she had no idea that she was going to die suddenly of a heart attack one week later. And to write out half of all you had in a charitable donation, I think really says something about a person's religiosity. Not just religiosity, but human kindness. But in any case, of course, you know, as her son, that's not what I remember most about my mom. What I remember most about my mom is how hard, hard she worked to give my four brothers and I, we had no sisters, how hard she worked to give my four brothers and I as normal and as balanced and as happy a life as she could provide us. And that was despite the handicap that we had acquired. And the handicap that we had acquired, I'm sad to say, and you probably already guessed it, was my dad, was my father. I don't know what it was with my father. Can you hear me all right? But my father 
was an extremely volatile man. He was one of the most violent people I've ever met. And he was extremely volatile. He had this inner rage boiling inside him. And he was like a volcano, always ready to erupt. And he erupted far too often. And every night he tried to quell that inner rage with hard, hard drinking. But his alcoholism only made him all the more unpredictable. For he could be, honestly, he could be, we could be at the dinner table and he could be laughing and joking one moment, and then a second later, something would trigger it, you'd never know exactly what it was, and then he would interpret something through the contortion of his alcoholism, and he would get enraged, and he would fly off the handle, and once he, that was triggered, for the next several hours, we would have a violence running through that house like you couldn't believe. I used to describe it like, here comes the tornado. You know, when I got old, of course, when I was a young kid, I was speechless. But it was worse than a tornado. Because I grew up, now I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and I know what tornadoes are like. And the good thing about tornadoes is, yes, they're violent, they're scary, they're vastly destructive, but they end quickly. And when my father erupted, it didn't end quickly. It would last several, several hours, and it would take a good deal of hard, hard drinking several hours before he would finally go to sleep. <laughs> go to sleep. So living with my father, and like I said, this was, used to seem like it was a daily thing. I know it wasn't. Couldn't have been. Or we'd all be dead now. But, you know, <laughs> it, it seemed like it was at least once or twice a week. Once or twice a week. So living with my dad was like carrying a box of nitroglycerin. You're always aware that the slightest shift could set him off, and once he got set off, forget it. You know, you just ran for cover. Uh, so my four brothers and I had a frightening and precarious child. But the worst of it, I was the fourth son, but the worst of it was watching my father regularly threaten, taunt, and abuse my mother. Uh, it's really not so bad when you're a child, and you are the, a boy, a young boy, and you are the target of your father's violence. It really isn't. You're too young to even comprehend what's going on. And at the moment of attack, you just want to get out of there. You're just trying to escape. You're not thinking about the psychological and emotional repercussions and after effects. You're just trying to save your heart. And when it's finally over, you might even excuse the onslaught. You think maybe you deserved it. If not for something you did this time, then maybe for something you did in the past and you felt you got away with it. Sometimes you could rationalize, pass it on. Maybe the next day is nice to you. And you try to be very forgiving, at least in the early days. But the terror of watching your father go after your mother is an entirely different level of fear. Because she's the only source of warmth and kindness softness, of love, and compassion, that you know in your already violent and chaotic existence. And you know, if he takes that away, you're left with nothing. But far worse than the fear is the guilt. Is the guilt. It overwhelms you and it comes from several directions. First of all, there's the guilt you feel for this antipathy that is growing in you toward your father, and you try to stop it, it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, becoming more and more a part of you. Because we're taught to love and respect our fathers, especially, I mean, in Catholic school, I've taught that every day. You're taught to love and respect your parents, especially your father. And we're born with a natural bond to our parents, and at the same time, you feel your own rage growing in toward and then, of course, it's the guilt that comes from knowing that at any night you might be the cause of this night's violence. Maybe something you said or did that your mom tried to get, you know, then tried to inter intervene is the cause of it. Maybe something you said or did unknown. You never really know quite what it is. Maybe just his dislike of you was the cause of an argument between your mom and him, and then it got out of control. It doesn't take much to get him out of control. Maybe something you said or did, that your mom tried to get, you know, then tried to inter intervene is the cause of it. Maybe something you said or did unknown. 
You never really know quite what it is. Maybe just his dislike of you was the cause of an argument between your mom and him, and then it got out of control. It doesn't take much to get him out of control. And then there is the worst, worst guilt of all. That's knowing that time and time and time again, your father went after your mother, and you did nothing. Of course, you're just a young child, but out of fear for your own safety, you hid upstairs, you pulled the blankets over, you curled up in your bed, you whimpered and you cried, you took the pillows and buried, buried your head under pillows, hoping to drown out the violence. But you knew that your father was going after her again and again and again, and every time, you did nothing. And with each such incident, you come to see with ever greater clarity your own weakness, your own incompetence, your own impotence, your uselessness, your cowardice. And the hate grows and festers inside. Not just for the man that you call father, but for yourself as well. It's a horrible, horrible thing to make a young child choose between himself or herself and their mother is horribly, horribly unfair. Um, <clears throat> when I was little, though, I, I used to daydream about life without my father. I just wanted the fear to go away. I just wanted to get out of this nightmare that was our life. So I prayed it again, again to God, the God I was taught about, the God of mercy, the God of love, the God of caring, the God who could do anything. So I prayed again and again to God to remove my father from our lives, but my dad was always there, and every year he got worse and worse and worse. And I began to wonder on, early on if God really was. I started wondering that question long before my classmates ever started considering those questions. I could not fathom why God would sentence my mom, a saintly woman, to lifelong punishment. I couldn't understand what great sin that she committed or that we, her children, had committed to deserve my father. I lacked the maturity to sort out such questions, but I definitely had enough fear and anger to provoke them. I was too young to see the wisdom in allowing my mom to suffer the violence and abuse of my father. I was too young to understand why God would let innocent children tremble night after night in their beds fearing that they might not see their mother the next morning. I was so too young to even see how the mercy and forgiveness of God could extend to my father with all his terrible failings. All I could see in my life was chaos and violence. And it became easy for me to start questioning the existence of God early on. The turmoil of the 60s and 70s, that's when I was a young teenager and then an older teenager. The turmoil of the 60s and early 70s only reinforced my skepticism. Uh, the assassinations of John and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, who were big heroes, people my age, only to be replaced by corrupt politicians like Spiro Agnew and Richard Nixon, we loathed, so it's utterly corrupt, it's totally disorienting. And then there was the violence of Vietnam. And they didn't cover Vietnam like they cover the war in Iraq, which essentially they don't cover the war in Iraq in the United States. They really covered the Vietnam War. They brought you up close and personal on the battlefield. And you saw soldiers in agony. You saw civilians getting slaughtered. Or at least you saw the after effects of that. Pictures of little children running down the street after a napalm attack with their bodies on fire. Night after night after night, you saw the young men being brought home in body bags. And you see that violence on the screen. You see the, play, the, the villages on fire. You see <coughs> bombs having gone off and body parts all over the place. I mean, they brought you, they brought you into the battle. And we witnessed that horror night after night. And in cities like mine, like Bridgeport, Connecticut, with its massive poverty, we had the race riot and the race wars. Long before gang fights and gangs became popular, we had gangs in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and we were making war on each other in the streets. And we had the burnings, the looting, the race riots. We had it all. And the world just looked like it was all coming apart. I remember I used to be saying to my mom, 
I don't think the United States of America is going to last much longer. And then there was, of course, the threat of nuclear annihilation. Could you imagine? All I could see in my world when I reached a teenager confirmed what my father had taught me so well. All I could see in my world was more chaos and violence. I saw that the world was dominated by undiscriminating violence and destruction. And very soon I began to wonder why. Why would an all-loving, all-perfect God make it that way? Why wouldn't he just make us angels if he wanted us to conform to his will and pop us into heaven? I mean, why would he make this inferior creature if he could make the superior being and put us into heaven? It just didn't make sense to me. Why would he expose us to such suffering if he was a God of love? I love my kids. I tried to everything possible to protect them from the slightest harm. And he puts us here in this this violence, this pain, this fear, why would he do that? Couldn't a more perfect God make a more perfect world? Couldn't understand it. Where does evil come from, I thought. Temptation, where does it come from? All things come from God. Why would he do that? And then the worst thing I thought was, He's going to pop almost all of us, according to my rule, you know, almost any faith. He's going to pop almost all of us in hell in the next life for just not having been born in the right creed. Does that seem fair, I thought? I began asking these questions, asking these questions at school, asking them of the nuns. Oh, Jeff, uh, that's a good question, I was told. Uh, I'll have to talk to Father Hanover about that. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Remember, Sister Bernadette said that one. She never got back to me. Father Hanover was a very impatient man. He probably said, kick him out of school. I got to high school. I would ask the same question. You know, finally, you know, junior year religion class, priest, theology major at the university, <laughs> Sacred Heart, not Sacred Heart University, Fairfield University, a fine institution. He decides he's going to prove to us the existence of God. He begins his proofs. I start bringing up my counter arguments. We go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he throws me out of class. <laughs> but before he throws me out of the class, he says to me, Jeff, if you don't believe in God, what the heck are you doing here in a Catholic school? Up to that point in my life, I never even thought about it. I always thought I was a Catholic. If you asked me that morning, what religion are you? I would have said, I'm a Roman Catholic. Suddenly, when he said to me, Jeff, if you don't believe in God, it dawned on me, do I really believe in God? And then he said, look, anybody like Jeff who doesn't believe in God, just get up and leave the classroom right now. I stood up. I walked out of that classroom. Six of my students followed me. I convinced them of the atheist. <laughs> 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 At 16 years old, at a Catholic school, the campus atheist. My friends treated me like I was some sort of hero. <laughs> I was a big shot on campus after that. That didn't help, of course. Just fed my ego. But the years would pass. But I never lost interest in religion. You know, I always, you know, discussed. I was always eager to discuss faith with almost anybody who was willing to discuss it. And I say that like, I think the reason was not because I was searching. At least I didn't really feel I was. I think it was sort of like the way, you know, ex-alcoholics need to become like, work for Alcoholics Anonymous or become counselors, you know. They need to stay close to the problem that they feel wrong them so much. And this, I felt that was the reason why I was so close to, you know, so eager to discuss religion with others. And this, I felt that was the reason why I was so close to, you know, so eager to discuss religion with others. But in any case, my, my relationships, my friendships went from one circle to another. And, you know, when I look back, there was a definite sort of pattern to it in a religious sense. First, my friends, of course, were all fellow atheists in high school. And I graduated high school. I got to the University of Connecticut, who's ranked 
20th in the nation today in football. <laughs> and, uh, and they're winning. And I got to the University of Connecticut, and I fell in with Jewish friends. And I became very, very close to uh, you know, my Jewish friends. And then I married a Jewish girl, and I became part of a wonderful Jewish family. And, uh, but she was an atheist also. Uh, <laughs> I think I played a big part in that. <laughs> but she was an atheist. And it was, you know, it was a very nice relationship, but I tell you the truth, I just did not have a, the ability to love anybody, really. I just couldn't find it in me. Because I learned that love just hurts. The object of your love could leave at any moment. And you know, I know that goes back to the person I loved most in my life, you know, when I was growing up. But it was true. I just couldn't let myself give my feelings towards anyone. So the marriage ended two and a half years later on good terms. And uh, but it was a nice experience, a beautiful family. I left them. I got to learn a lot about the Jewish perspective. Much understood, much misunderstood. And then I left that family, and, uh, and then I began to fall in with Buddhists and Hindus at uh, Purdue University, my, where I went to graduate school. And then towards the end, I met a couple of Muslims. And uh, to tell you the truth, their religion seemed no more irrational than anybody else's, and that surprised me, because you know I had always felt that that was by far the most barbaric faith on the internet. But I realized that they have, they have certain rationale and way of explaining themselves. And they were no near, were nearly as bad as I thought they would be. But when I went to the University of San Francisco to begin my first job as an assistant professor, uh, I sort of took up where I left off. And I got adopted. Or I don't know if they adopted me or I adopted them. But I fell in with a Muslim family. And we became very close. And they were not much older than I was. Their father had died. Their oldest male, and that's an important position in a Muslim uh, Saudi Arabian family. The oldest male was about uh, 22, 23, about four years younger than I was. Uh, the oldest sister was about 25, 24, three, you know, just a few years younger than I was. They're all sort of my age. And of course, they had a mom who was quite a bit older, but she wasn't there when I first met them. So I fell in with them, and we became very close. It was a wonderful relationship. And then we started talking about religion. Even though, you know, my mood, our relationship began by him taking me to all the bars in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> but that made me feel safe in my mood. <laughs> Good, this guy is nice. <laughs> He's normal. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way I thought. And, uh, and they were not very religious, so I liked them. So I felt comfortable talking to religion about them. And uh, we would discuss religion, and, uh, and I'd ask them questions and things like that. And then one day they asked me what I believe, what religion I believe. And I looked at them, and this was something I don't usually share with anybody. I usually kept that to myself. But I told them, well, frankly, I usually dodge the question. But this time I said, honestly, that's how close we were. I don't believe in God. And they looked at me like, you know, I just told them I was dying of cancer. <laughs> and they said, uh, why, why not? And I began to tell them. I just thought I'd give them a couple of indications. Well, you know, guys, there's so much violence in the world, and I just don't see how that, you know, how that, how that gels with the existence of an all-merciful, loving God. And then they would say, they would start arguing against me, and then I would start arguing back, and then I would uh, present more reasons and more reasons and more reasons, and I'd be asked to start asking them questions. They'd get back in the corners and things like that. Finally, they said to me, Jeff, can you please not, after about three or four of these conversations, not talk about religion anymore? <laughs> doesn't seem to be doing us much good, and it doesn't seem to be doing you any good either. So, they asked me not to talk about religion anymore. And I felt ashamed of myself because in America there's three things you don't talk about with other people. You know, I've, I've just sensitivity to others, out of respect. You don't talk to them about what, how much money they make, you don't talk to them about what their politics are, and you don't talk to them about their religion. So, you know, I felt like, I felt ashamed, I felt awkward. So what I did was very awkward, discussing religion with them. 
I think their reaction was almost the same, but in reverse. I think they felt like, oh, we feel so ashamed with ourselves. We cut off the conversation. This guy wanted to talk. You know, the Saudis are so hospitable and so sensitive to their guests. I think they felt that they had offended me. In any case, and there's reasons for that later, I found out. But in any case, to make a long story short, uh, I'm going to my office one day at the University of San Francisco, and I walk into my office at Harney Science Center, and I always leave the door unlocked. And you might think that's crazy, but I am the most scatterbrained person on earth. I lose my keys several times a day. <laughs> my mother says I'm the most absent-minded person in existence. She used to say if my head wasn't attached to my neck, I would have lost it long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember my mom saying she had a great sense of humor. But in any case, and she had to deliver my dad. But in any case, so I left, always left the office door unlocked, and students would leave things in there, homework assignments, books. It became just common knowledge. Professor Lang's door is always open, even when he's not there. So in any case, I walk in this one morning, a couple weeks after the conversation with the, my Saudi friends, my new Saudi family, and I walk in, and there is a green text sitting on my desk. And I assumed it must be a math text or something similar or something to the law. So I walk over and I look at the text and I look down and there on the cover it says something it's like the Holy Quran and English interpretation. And I looked at that and I stared at it and I just got angry. You know, there's one thing you don't want to do with an atheist. <laughs> Make him or her think that you're trying to push your religion on him. You know, and I thought, what do they mean by this? I think I stood there for about 15 minutes without sitting down, looking at the Quran, thinking, what do they mean by this? <laughs> do they think I'm trying to say I have to become a Muslim if our friendship is to continue? Are they trying to convert me to their faith? And I was really unnerved. Then I thought about it. Think about it rationally, Jeff. They go out to bars. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any of them pray even though they talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> During Ramadan, they ask me out for lunch. <laughs> you know, they're not the most religious people in the world. Never seen them trying to push the religion out of anybody else. They never even brought up the subject to me. I was always the one that initiated the conversation. I quickly realized this was a peace gesture. They felt they had offended me. They were giving me this copy of the Quran essentially to say, Jeff, we can't, we don't have a clue about the kind of questions you answered. And we're sorry we had to cut off the conversation, but if you're really interested in that at all in our religion, here's a copy of the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dump it on his desk, that's the end. And they never brought it up. And I didn't bring it up either. He just received it as a gift. Although I did find out that they were the ones that dropped it off there. I received it as a gift, and I put it on my shelf. And I thought, someday I'll take it to take a glance at it. You know, just out of curiosity. I mean, I'm fascinated by religion. But things got busy. Weeks went by. But then I ran out of stuff to read because I had shipped all my books from Purdue University because I was a poor graduate student, the cheapest method possible. And they told me that it would take two, three months to get there. But now it was like six months, and they still hadn't arrived. And I had given up hope. And I loved to read. I had nothing to read. And the few books I did bring with me, I had long, I'd read some of them twice by now. Magazines were read. I'm sitting in my apartment in Diamond Heights one night, nothing to read. I turn on the Johnny Carson show, watch for 15 minutes, turn it off. And I look over to my left, and there on the coffee table, and somehow I moved it to the coffee table, was the green text, and on it said an English interpretation of the Holy Quran, something like that. The Holy Quran and English interpretation. <coughs> So I thought I would pick it up and just have a quick glance. And I look over to my left, and there on the coffee table, and somehow I moved it to the coffee table, was the green text, and on it said an English interpretation of the Holy Quran, something like that. The Holy Quran and English interpretation. So I thought I would pick it up and just have a quick glance. You know, I, up to that point, I never really got a lot out of reading scripture. I did read some translations, various scriptures, but found you get more out of talking to people, you know, or reading about the religion, what other people write about it, rather than actually reading the scripture. 
So I wasn't expecting much. So I picked it up and I began reading it. I thought I'd read a few pages. And it surprised me. Even the first sura surprised me. It's the one the young man said, he recited today? No, he recited it the other day. You know, or he recited the earlier program today. The first sura of the Quran, just seven lines. All praise be to God, ruler of all worlds, the merciful, compassionate, master of this. You know, it's like a hymn of praise. It reminds me of the Psalms of David. That's what I related. And then I got to the end of it, and then I suddenly realized it switched from being a hymn of praise to a prayer for guidance. And I thought, oh, how clever this author is. <laughs> Tricked me into making a prayer for guidance. Prayer to God I didn't even believe in. And I thought, well, at least he's clever. You know, so I turned to the next Sura, and it begins, uh, Aleph, Lam, Neem, three are six letters. That is the book, wherein no doubt is the guidance for those who are under guard, you know, alert, under guard, under, under tow. You know, so I read that, and I said, uh, are you talking to me? <laughs> Since I just made a prayer for guidance inadvertently, and now it's saying, that is the book wherein no doubt is the guidance. <laughs> now I look at the opening line and it says, that is the book. So I thought, you know, this author really is very good. <laughs> because first of all, he's doing something ingenious. He's writing a revelation. And instead of making a revelation, the history of a people or a biography of somebody or a bunch of great anecdotes, a beautiful story, it's God's personal address to the reader. Since you're reading it, it's God addressing you. I thought, he's bold, but he's also, you know, genius. It's like the Ten Commandments expanded to a text. So I was very intrigued. So I kept on reading. And the next several lines, the next 20 or so lines, sort of summarize what the Quran is all about. And then it talks about the prerequisites for gaining knowledge and guidance from the scripture talks about those who may not gain guidance, talks about those who will reject it out of hand and can't be guided by it, dismisses them in one line. And then it talks about people who are on the fence, you know, it goes into some detail about them and their inability to make their minds up and, you know, some of the re-psychological psychology behind their kind of uh, waveringness and uncertainty. And then finally, after it gets through that, it talks about the use of allegory and prophetic guidance and things like that in very concise, short, form fits all that in. It's beautiful poetic style, lyrical style, even though it doesn't resemble Arabic poetry. So in any case, then after I get through that, I come to verse 30 of the Quran, and I'm, you know, I'm impressed, but you know, I'm ready, getting close to ready to just read a few more pages. Then I come upon this verse, and it says, uh, Behold, your Lord said to the angel, I am going to place a vice prince on earth, a representative of mine, a successor, a uh, emissary, might be a good word. The Arabic word is Khalifa for the Arabs in the audience. I'm sure you know it. Uh, it's hard to translate, but that's pretty close. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, this is a heavenly announcement. And in the announcement, God says in heaven before all the angels and hosts, I'm going, makes this phenomenal election. I'm going to make this, I'm about to create a representative of mine on earth, one who acts on my behalf. And then the angel said in the next verse, will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed much blood? Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? I read that verse, and I just froze, because it all came back to me. You know, I was graduate, I was a professor now, I had sort of kind of cut away from my past, veiled myself from it, felt I was getting away from it, and that verse just brought it all back. It brought forth back my dad, my mom, the chaos, the violence, my neighborhood, the gang fights, Vietnam, all of it just came rushing back through my mind. That was, that was my question. God starts it by saying, yeah, I'm going to create this great representative of mine on earth. And the angels say, you're going to put there in one who's going to spread corruption and shed much blood? 
when you could just make us? While we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? Why are you creating this most criminally inclined and violent and destructive being? When you could just make us who celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name? That was, it felt like the author had taken my whole life and, could, and reduced it to those two lines. I felt like, I felt this, this weight come over me. As if he had pulled me into some dark and silent corner to speak only and directly to me. I felt like this was written for me. And then the answer, he said, God said, to the back to the angels in response, truly I know what you do not know. In modern parlance, you might say, truly I know exactly what I'm doing. I thought, you know what you do not know? You know exactly what you're doing? Are you joking? Don't you know what pain we're going through down here? Don't you know what kind of violence this world is dominated by? How the evil always seems to inevitably win out? With the wars, the famine, and AIDS, and corruption, and George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> you get the point, though. I'll never, every speech, I gotta go after George Bush. But, but seriously, you know, don't you realize the magnitude of human suffering? And I say all that just to give you a sort of a feeling for <coughs> what happened as I was reading through the Quran. Why are we constantly finding, getting in this veritable dialogue with the scripture, with the author? A very, very emotional dialogue. You know? And at this moment, here I am, you know, arguing against a God I don't even believe in, saying, don't you realize what you're doing to us? My four brothers went down that same dark path of alcoholism and drug addiction as my father. That was their escape. My escape was I used my mathematical ability to get out of Bridgeport, Connecticut when I was 18, and I very seldom came back after that. I never looked back. My four brothers weren't so lucky. One was a heroin addict, another one was an addict when he was 13, my, the brother I was closest to. Another one was a cocaine addict and a heroin addict. Another one was an alcoholic, and he died from it at an early age. My mom had to live through all that and suffer the guilt for knowing that she never divorced my father. And that became a major problem for her as she got older. But in any case, so you could see, I was really amazed. And to make it worse, the question is being asked in heaven. You know, why would you create this criminal creature, put him in an environment where he could work out his worst criminal incl inclinations, having this false feeling of independence from God, when you could just make them angels and pop them into heaven? A lot of content in that verse. You know, why would you create this criminal creature, put him in an environment where he could work out his worst criminal incl inclinations, having this false feeling of independence from God, when you could just make them angels and pop them into heaven. A lot of content in that verse. Well, I had to know how he answered the question. You know, I didn't believe in God. I wasn't hoping to ever believe in God. I just was curious. I thought the author had committed theological suicide by bringing up that question <laughs> at the beginning of the story of humanity. You know, ask it at the end, at least. <laughs> Not at the beginning. You're going to lose most of your audience right there. But I had to see what he had to say. So I came to the next verse. And it reads, And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, Tell me their names if you are right. Now, you know, I had read the story of Adam many times. It's a beautiful, beautiful biblical story, by the way horrible, passionate, you know, really a lot of angst in that story. I thought, did the author get it wrong? I mean, did he just not understand the story? I mean, because you know why we're here from a biblical perspective. I mean, you know, it's life is punishment for that being sin. But, you know, he seems to have it wrong, you know? He's saying, I'm about to put this vice on her. 
I told her, I thought, you know, no, you know, we're not put here to fill some positive function, to be elected to some lofty role. We're put here as a punishment. But that's not what the verse says. The angels ask the obvious questions, and now God, Quran, and presumably God, from the perspective of the Quran, is starting to explain things. And then he taught Adam the names of all things. So in answer to the angel's question, first the Quran is emphasizing that God teaches man, and man is a learning creature. And then he taught Adam the names of things, and then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Now, I, when you read a text like this, you kind of, you know, I was always taught to learn how to, how to read poetry and, you know, classical works. So you've got to kind of read between the lines. But what is it saying, you know? God, it emphasizes that God teaches man how to name things. In particular, what special intellectual gift is God teaching him? How to communicate verbally with others? How to assign verbal symbols to all that comes into human imagination? And the Quran says this is one of the great gifts that God gave. So one of the preeminent gifts that God gave man over the other beings. His great ability to communicate. Later in the Quran, it will say, Read in the name of your Lord who created man out of a tiny creature that claims. And then it orders the reader again, Read, for your Lord is the most powerful. For he gave man the use of the pen. And taught him with it. He taught man the use of the pen. Taught him what he could not know emphasizing the collective way we all learn, especially through the use of the pen. Ron says that this ability to communicate, and to communicate verbally, and to communicate via writing, is one of the great, great gifts that God gives humankind. And the very next verse after that one I just said, but truly man is ungrateful because he views himself as independent of God. He starts to think that he's so great intellectually that he even starts to think he doesn't need God. He starts to challenge the existence. Very powerful verse. But in any case, God puts great emphasis on the human intellect. But here it seems to be, seems to be emphasizing it in response to the angel's question. Because not only does he teach man, but then he gives the angels an intellectual test. He places the things, some things before the angels and says to me, now name them if what you said about the humans, the humans is right. But it doesn't make sense to create. What did the angel say? They said, glory be to you, O God. We have no knowledge except what you taught us. We don't have the understanding, the intellect, the knowledge to perform this task. It's way beyond them. They say, in truth, it is you who are knowing, the wise. You have the knowledge, the wisdom. It's easy for you. You are God. You're infinitely knowing, wise. But we're only angels. This is way beyond them. See, it's emphasizing intelligence, intellect. Now what did the next verse say? And then it says, and then he said, God said, Oh Adam, tell them their names. And then the very next verse says, And then when he had told them their names, it's nothing for the human. In the style, it jumps right to that statement as if it's a hop, skip, and a park for Adam. Oh Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, it's nothing for them. Nothing for the men. And when he had told them their names, God said to the angels, Did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? Did I not tell you that I see the big picture, that I know exactly what I'm doing? The angels failed where the human excelled easily. And that I know what you reveal and what you conceal? And I stopped for a second. I said, wait. Okay, you've emphasized human intellect here. Showed the angels that men are potentially intellectually superior to angels. Okay, I got that. What's this line about revealing and concealing? You didn't say anything about revealing and concealing. Did I not tell you what you reveal and conceal? And this is the method of the Quran. It asks questions where the answer is you have to sort of reach inside yourself and think and deliberate and ponder. It forces you to read between the lines. I'm looking at that and I said, what did God reveal and conceal? What did the angel's question reveal and conceal? Scott said, did I not tell you what you reveal and conceal? So I think about it for a second and I think, well, what they revealed was obvious. Human 
humanity's sinister propensity, man's criminal nature, human destructiveness and violence. Are you following? But what did they conceal? I didn't see them conceal anything. It didn't mention what they conceal. And then, of course, I realized it's the obvious. The flip side of the coin. Yes, humans could do great violence. Yes, they could do terrible destruction. Yes, they could do tremendous evil. But they could also do tremendous good. But the angels, like I, was always blinded to that side of human nature. The angels in their question, and I myself, was always blinded to that side of human nature. I always just saw the dark side. It was too moon too big in my mind. Blinded me to the other side, yeah. Human beings could do tremendous good. They could rise to the heights of compassion and empathy and goodness and self-sacrifice. And sometimes the arrival of one type provokes the arrival of the other type on the human stage. So you get Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt, right? Forces of Franklin Roosevelt to rise to his, his evil. You know, or you get the same, that sort of thing, the very evil, very good, arriving on the same stage of the same country at the same moment in history. You know, or the same city, or same city block. Maybe, I thought, even the same house. But in any case, what the crime was doing was forcing me to think. It was opening my eyes to other possibilities. But it was involving me in this perpetual dialogue. Very often I get really mad at the author, whom I assumed was a man, of course. And then the next line says, uh, and behold, he said to the angels, and I won't take you through the entire Quran, by the way. <laughs> Unless we're going to be here until, I don't know, next September. <laughs> I'd like to, but you know, we'll all die of starvation. <laughs> and then the, the next line says, I'll just take you through a few more lines, and then try to rush things along after that. And we said, and by the way, if you want to find it in greater detail, it's a chapter about a hundred page long in my book, uh, Losing Our Religion, A Call for Help. You know, I write about this at some length. So I'm just going to, you know, sort of uh, uh, summarize. And we said, in the next line it says, and we said, oh Adam. No, in the next line it says, after a, a behold, Adam tells her the angels, et cetera. The next line says, and behold, we said to the angels, after the humans succeed, the humans succeed, but the angels fail. And behold, we said to the angels, now bow down to Adam. <coughs> and they bowed down. Not so Iblis. It says he refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. So, in response to that demonstration, God says to the angels, now bow down to Adam. And I thought, what does bowing down connote? Because, you know, I already realized that this author could pack tremendous meaning in just a few words. So I began to read it as if I was reading mathematics, you know, line by line, word by word. In mathematics, you have to pay, any math majors or, yeah, you got to pay attention to every single detail. Every word in mathematics is essential, isn't it? It's great. It's great. <laughs> it's beautiful. So that's the way I started reading it, like mathematics. You know, every single word analyzed. So it said, and behold, we said to Adam, to the angels, bow down to Adam. I began to think, what does bow down mean, signify? Well, I just thought about it. What does it signify in human life? Bowing down, when one bows to another, often symbolizes servitude. One is going to serve the other. Now in the Quran, everything serves God, ultimately. But the Quran seemed to be saying that the angels, and this would be supported later on, the angels serve, serve God in this way. They serve in humanity in, in, in their development on earth. They guide them, human, humans, in their development here on earth, their spiritual and moral development. So they're here to serve us in some sense, this source of magnanimous urging, these angelic influences we feel. And what else does it mean? It also mean, could mean that one is superior to another. And certainly that seems to be the point in the Quran. Humans are potentially superior to angels. The angels ask the question, why create best when you could create us? God says, listen, listen, you didn't consider this. 
And now he's telling me to now bow down to Adam after this demonstration. So it seems that the Quran is saying humans, with all their flaws, their voluntary surrender to God is more valued in God's sight. Their, val their voluntary turning to God is more valuable in God's sight than the angels' program submission to God. But that comes later. So they're told, bow down to Adam. And then it says, not so Iblis. Now, who is Iblis? Later in the crowd, that confused him. What is Iblis? What are the angels? Well, you know, later in the crowd, you find the angels do what they are told to do. They are pro almost programmed creatures. You know, they cannot go against God's will. So who is Iblis? He was among the angels. Well, the Quran tells us he wasn't an angel. He was actually of the jinn, another unseen entity. But he's an unseen entity of a potentially rebellious nature. And it turns out that Iblis is the father of temptation. God introduces not just the angelic influences that we are exposed to, but the satanic influences as well. But source of temptation, but subliminal whispering that the Quran describes it in our mind. And that's the sole role of Satan in the Quran. He's stripped of all the other powers that we associate with him, and his sole purpose is to give us those subliminal dark urges when we're faced with a moral dilemma. And in one place in the Quran, it has Satan say on the Day of Judgment, I had no power whatsoever over you. I but whispered, and you followed. So he is the that perpetual voice we hear in our mind, urging us to do the wrong thing. And the angels are that perpetual voice when we're faced with a moral decision that urges us to do the right thing. And the Quran and the Quran, these two voices that we hear in our in modern language, in our minds, in the Quran, in our hearts, in the Quran, in the whisperings in our chests, these two forces that we are exposed to heighten our awareness of um, the morality that, of, of a decision that we're facing. They act as sort of moral catalysts. They bring to our mind when we're faced with a moral dilemma the, the, the greatness of the situation. So that when I'm thinking of cheating on a test, I very much brings it into focus. And one voice is saying to me, go on, get the good grade. The other voice is saying, no, that's cheating. Do the right thing. And I'm starting to sweat and get nervous because I'm hearing it from this side and that side. It's, uh, it's really a catalyst for spiritual decision making. And that seems to be their primary role as you read through the rest of the Quran. I'm reading ahead a little bit. But in any case, but what the Quran seems to be saying here is what? In answer to the angel's question, first the Quran says, look, these human beings are intellectual beings. Didn't I tell you I see the whole picture? But God said he's going to put the beings on earth. When is he going to put them on earth? Well, not yet. First, they have to go through this teaching process. They have to learn. Okay, and they're gaining wisdom, they're gaining knowledge, etc. He's still not putting them on earth. Now we find something else about the human beings. They're subject to not just angelic inspiration, but satanic inspiration. What is the God telling us about human beings? They are also not just intellectual beings, but moral beings. They have an intrinsic understanding of right and wrong, and they receive moral impulses in both directions. Are they ready to go on earth yet? Now God should put them on earth. We now know they're moral beings. They're subjected to these two influences. They're intellectual beings. Okay, put them on earth. No, God's not ready to put them on earth. And behold, he said, the angels bowed down to Adam, and they bowed down, not so at least, they refused and was of the error. Selfishness. Always putting yourself above the rights of others. You feel the right to impinge on someone else's God-given right because you're selfish and arrogant. In any case, but that's a peripheral. He was of those who reject faith. So we go to the next verse, and we said, oh Adam, dwell you, I have other verses written down to support that one, but skip it. I want to stick with the story as it is. I'm trying to give, keep you close to my first read. Is that okay? <laughs> and then we said, oh Adam, Dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and it, eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near all uh, this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I read that verse and I thought, the Quran certainly has a penchant for understating things. You know, because this is the famous and faithful command. You know, oh, 
Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrong doers. What's wrong with that verse, I thought. I suppose that you came from a background like mine. There's no sense of urgency. There's no tension in that verse. It was taken out. You know, the story I grew up with, which I thought was a magnificent story, I looked at all these things from a literary perspective. I'm sorry, I did. And I'm not putting it down. I think it's beautiful and powerful. But in the story I grew up with, God is threatened at the possibility that man may eat from the tree. But in this verse, he's as relaxed as can be. Oh, Adam, you and your spouse dwell in a garden, eat freely the robe you wish, to come that near, and it's like the tree is picked at random. You come that near, let's see. Uh, <laughs> or you will be among the wrong doors. I thought, does this author not understand the story? You know, because it's like he's using the same things, but he's permuting the details and telling it another way and bringing up different critical changes. It's almost as if he's using it, this great, great story, a captivating story, as a vehicle for an original message. Sorry, no better story to capture the reader than this one. And they can see things he didn't see before. At least I thought that's what he was doing with me. So you and your spouse, and he really don't what you wish, but come down here in this street, for you'll be the one going And I was really getting confused and frustrated. And then the next verse, but Satan caused them to slip and expel them from the state in which they were. And we said, go you all down. Some of you will be adversaries of others. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. Slip? I thought Satan caused them to slip. I thought he really has a penchant for understating things. The greatest sin in the history of humanity? The very sin why we're all down here sentenced to life? very sin by which we're all suffering and slogging and the pain and divorce and, you know, the misery of life. My life wasn't going well at that moment. <laughs> My love life wasn't. But in any case, all that, the breakups, the agony, the pills, you know. <laughs> oh, well, agony is me. You know, all this, and he describes this thing, like I said, the AIDS, the conflict, the violence, the wars, George Bush. He describes it as a slip. I, I, I just thought that was a mistranslation. I went to my Arab friends. Excuse me. Um, I just want you to help me interpret this verse. They go, oh. I went to my Arab friends. Excuse me. Um, I just want you to help me interpret this verse. They go, oh, dear. <laughs> you know, I'm still looking at their face. Yeah, let's try this verse. Let's try this just word by word. I just want to, just literally, don't read into it anything. They said, Jeff, we hardly ever read the cry. Okay, that'll help. <laughs> so the verse says, Zalahum uh, al shaitan minha. So we read it. Uh, word by word, take me in that way. So, 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 Zalahum shaitan. Satan did what? Satan what? What's the word mean? Well, he said it's the causal form, form four of the verb uh, zella, which means to slip. It means uh, to cause to slip, to make a slip. He said, are you sure about that? He looked at me, to make a slip. <laughs> Satan made them slip? I th we got on an Arabic English dictionary, I looked it up. It says slip. This is a momentary loss of Focus. A brief loss of focus. The greatest sin? A brief loss of, loss of focus? My brother Mark, whenever he used to make a mistake, he also used to toss it up. I'd say, I'm sorry, Jeff, I slipped up. My Uncle Bob, when he used to pick me up from work 10 minutes late every day, or 15 minutes, he was an alcoholic also, Uncle Bob. But he used to always come and pick me up for work late. He used to say, sorry, Jeff, slipped up. Won't happen again every single day. <laughs> but the connotation is it's something minor. And here it was. It means something minor. It's a slip. Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. They were no longer the state in which they were. How could that be a slip? And I thought about it. Wait a minute, Jeff. You just can't let go of your background. 
Was it anything but a slip? Was it really all so bad? Did they murder somebody? Did they commit highway robbery? Did they commit grand theft? They didn't even bump off a 7-Eleven. <laughs> they had a couple pieces of fruit. <laughs> You're not going to throw somebody into jail and throw in a lock and key for eating an apple, for God's sake. It doesn't say it was an apple. But, you know, they ate something. Yeah, it's just a slip. According to the Quran, everything it says in the Quran, everything it will say after this, it was just a slip, was a minor thing. And God, for the next verse, forgives them right away. But here it says, But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, Go down, all of you together. Some of you will be adversaries of others. Hmm, I thought. Hmm. Well, the angels alluded to that, though. And then on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. Dwelling place and provision? No, you got it all wrong. Earth is not your dwelling place and provision. Earth will be pain for you. That's what it says. That's what it's supposed to say. You're going to be in pain there, and you're going to, you know, you're going to stub your toe on the ground, and it's going to be thorns, and it's going to work by the sweat of your brow, and you're going to be a working creature like a slave. And then, and what? What else? And then the woman. Where's the woman? And then the woman. You, you, because you tempted man and leaped yourself with Satan, you will suffer everyday labor pain. <laughs> you, you must be buried. And the worst of all, even though you're more intelligent than man, because you duped him with a leak and by leaking with eight, you, he will be made to rule over you. <laughs> it's powerful. It is powerful. And here in the Quran, I'm not making fun of it. I love that story. Always did. Here are the Qur'an's emphasizing and using this vehicle to just bring out a different perspective on life. Because here, God doesn't lose it. He's not even angry. He says, go you all down, some of you will be adversaries of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. And dwelling place, you know. The word the Qur'an uses for dwelling place, it's like a place of comfortable repose. The word that uses for uh, Provision, what a bad interpretation. It means like something that's enjoyable to eat, things that are enjoyable to dine on. Or it's not, it's not the words of an enraged deity. When I walked into the hotel yesterday and they said, uh, Mr. Lang, your uh, boat will be room 646, and uh, for your provision, there will be a continental breakfast in the morning. I didn't go, <gasps> what do you mean? <laughs> it's not the word that somebody is angry at you. And then, it's okay, God's not angry. Why is he playing that on earth, I thought. What's going on here? And then the next verse confused me more. That Adam received words from his Lord. And his Lord turned to him mercifully. For he's truly oft returning, ever merciful. Let's talk about mercy and forgiveness and turning towards Adam. In the Quran, the word tawab means that God turns towards others. He just doesn't forgive. He reaches out, he assuages, he guides, he inspires, he helps. But in any case, when Adam received word from his Lord, and he turned to him, for truly is oft returning the merciful. The next verse that we find later in the Quran, we find he just said that explicitly, he forgave them. Notice that most of the responsibilities we put on Adam. But in any case, God forgives them. Then okay, then why not just put them back into heaven? I turn to the next verse, and again it emphasizes this going down business. But in case I thought that the Quran was saying that they're put down on earth as a punishment, once again the Quran shows me a different light. It says, we said, go down from the state, all of you together, and truly there will come to you guidance from me. And whoever follows my guidance has nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. God in this verse is comforting the human. They made a mistake. They're now in this unfamiliar environment. They feel afraid. They feel remorse. They feel insecure. What does God do? He reaches out to them and assures them, I know this is hard. I know you're afraid. But you have nothing to fear. 
just follow my guidance. It'll come to you. It'll come to you in many forms. But whoever follows my guidance, they have nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. It's like I sometimes say to my children, I know sometimes life is hard, but it is necessary. You need to go through this. This is how you grow. And then I thought again, wait a minute, now he's definitely forgiving them. Okay, then put them back into heaven. You know? It's conflicting with my, you know, the way I always thought about this. I mean, once, like for example, my daughter Jamila. I hope you don't mind me giving a quick example. My daughter Jamila. I'll try to tie this up in 25 minutes. Sorry for taking so long. My daughter Jamila uh, did something wrong. And she was 12 years old at the time. And I said to Jamila, I said, Jamila, because of what you did, it wasn't bad, but it was still bad. I'm going to dock your allowance this month. Your five dollars. She said to me, she didn't say to me, she looked at me and the tears started to speak. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says I'm the biggest marshmallow in the world. I am the biggest marshmallow. I look at the tears and I go, all right, all right. <laughs> I forgive you. I forgive you, honey. Just, you know, to cry. I realize, you know, this is something you have to go through. I forgive you. She, immediately the tears stop as if she turned them off the thought. <laughs> but she looks at me and says, without skipping a beat, uh, do I still get the five dollars? <laughs> Typical to me. I said, no, now wait a minute. I want you to learn from this, and I think it's important that I take She interrupts me. Daddy, either punish me or forgive me. Punish me, don't give me the five dollars. You forgave me, give me the five dollars. <laughs> Her logic was unassailable. I told her, okay, you got the five dollars. But okay, God forgives them. Put them back in heaven. Why not? Obviously, that's what you should do. And I thought about it. Wait a minute, Jeff. Nowhere in this does it suggest that humans on earth as a punishment. When God says I'm about to put the humans on earth to be my vice friends, the angels ask the obvious question. That would be a perfect place for the Quran to clarify. Yes, I know. They are destructive creatures. And when they do that kind of violence, then I'm going to put them on earth as a punishment. No. It says, no, you didn't see, I see the big picture. See, they're very intelligent, and they're moral beings, and they could grow morally and spiritually. And when does he finally put them on earth? They go through this development pattern. Not when they grow spiritually, not when they grow intellectually, not when we find out all about them. They finally get ready to go to earth. When does God feel they're ready? When they exercise their first independent choice, their ability that God gave them to make an independent choice. Then they're ready. Then he puts them on earth. And then he forgives them immediately. I just finally got to my head. It was banging my head. Boom, Jeff, think, 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 think. You're not here as a punishment. Then they're ready. Then he puts them on And then he forgives them immediately. I just finally got to my head. It was banging my head. Boom, Jeff, think, 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 think. You're not here as a punishment. I got through that story, and I thought, I've got to read the rest of this Quran. <laughs> the man who wrote this, I thought, was genius. You know, or at least up till now. I had to figure out, OK, you convinced me. We're not here as a punishment. I get it. And why are we here? Make sense of it to me. So I began reading the Quran, verse by verse, line by line, word by word, looking for anything that would hint in that direction. Are you following me? And now I'm going to try to summarize quickly, sort of, what happened. Um, in that story, I noticed, is this thing working, guys? In that story, I noticed, can I try this now? OK, in that story, I noticed it was emphasizing many things. And I'll just write down some of them. One is humans are going to suffer on Earth, right? Suffering seems to play some major role in mankind's drama on Earth. Uh, two, next thing that came up was it emphasized in the story, human intelligence, human intellect, in response to the angel's question. The angels emphasize the suffering, God demonstrates the superior human intellect. Next thing, choice. God, you see, he doesn't put the humans on earth until they exercise their ability to make moral choices. Then he's, they're ready to begin their earthly sojourn. Then they're ready to become his representative on earth if they choose the role. Other things are emphasized, you know, divine guidance, God's forgiveness, you know, in the form of his turning to the 
repentant person and helping them and assuaging them and guiding them and so forth and so on. Forgiveness and uh, divine guidance, guidance and trying to think of other things. I usually have a whole list here. But in any case, the three that I want to emphasize right off the bat, though, the three that intrigued me were suffering, intellect, and choice. These were the things I used to argue against my mother with. Why would God give us, make us put us down here to suffer? Why does he give us intellect if our minds lead us to naturally question his existence and come up with powerful arguments against it? Why does he give us choice? Why didn't he just program us to be good at it if he wants us to be good? Are you following me? So these were the three that interest me the most. So when I was reading through the Quran, I was really keeping alert to anything it had to say about suffering, intellect, and choice. And the first thing I wanted to wonder was, maybe I was reading into the story something that wasn't there. I hope I'm not boring you all. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I'm lecturing mathematics, and I'm down here in front of the audience, and I'm writing, and I'm getting into it, and I'm really getting excited. I look at my audience, and they look like they're ready to die. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this has been a long fight. We've been going all more than an hour now, an hour and five minutes. Give me about 15 minutes, okay? But, um, so I was reading through the Quran. Does the Quran really emphasize these things? Maybe I was reading too much between the lines. So I stayed alert to anything that had to, was being said about these three things. Does the Quran, I'll go through this quickly, does it really emphasize the importance of intellect, human intellect, in the attainment of faith in our, in our sojourn here on earth. And it definitely does. Uh, the rational and didactic tone of the Quran is one of its most salient features. Time and time again, or Orientalists even, who had a chip on their shoulder when it came to Islam back in the days of early Orientalism, would point out that the Quran puts too much stress, they thought, on reason, on the use of reason, and an importance of reason. And one of the, the Quran's fundamental theme is that most people or re, re, ignore or reject God's signs and revelation and corrupt religion. Why? Because they fail to use their reason. The Quran says it again and again. They will not use their reason. It says they prefer to follow tradition. When you tell them, why don't you use your reason, they say, well, we're going to do what our fathers told us to do. We're going to follow in our father's footsteps. And then the Quran says what? Even though their fathers were ignorant? Will they not use the reason? We're constantly asked that question again and again. It says that those who distort religion, they refuse to reason. And there are people who do not reason. The Quran says that exactly eight times. And then it says, will you not use your reason? It asks 14 times. It says, God reveals signs, blessings, and admonitions so that Perhaps you will use your reason. It's eight, such eight times that quote appears. It says, in the Quran, from its viewpoint, reason and faith are allies. One helps the other. Reason and faith are allies, just as illogic and false belief are, from the standpoint of the Quran. It says, those who benefit most from the Quran. Here's how it describes those who benefit most from the Quran. And there's a lot to be read in how uh, an author describes faith. Those who benefit most from the Quran are persons of insight, 16 such descriptions, firmly rooted in knowledge, 8, use the reason, 10, stand on clear evidence and proof, 7. You notice? Saying that, oh, the people that are, you know, in, are get guided most by the scripture are using their reason, right? Are intelligent, are reflective, they ponder. Well, those who are opposed to revelation are, look at these descriptions, deluded and man nine such descriptions, and manifest error and obvious error, 28 such descriptions, ignorant, 15, foolish, 3, have no understanding, 9, only follow surmise and conjecture, 9, and blindly hear to tradition. Now, for those of you in the Muslim community, that describes most of our leadership. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to say. Well, that's too harsh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But sometimes it's true. In an almost Socratic style, the Quran repeatedly quizzes the reader and calls into question his or her assumption. Again and again it asks, what do you think? It begins 18 questions with those three words. What do you think? Have you considered? 17. 
such questions. Begin that way. Do you suppose? Seven. Sounds like a philosopher. Do you suppose? Do they not ponder? Do you think at all? Eighteen such questions. The message is clear from the standpoint of the Quran. To gain truer faith, we need to free ourselves from inherited notions and examine our beliefs rationally. Always have that responsibility. I could go on and on about this, but I think you get the point. The Quran, I believe, really does a tremendous emphasis on reason and the attainment of faith. What about choice? I'll just read you a few verses very quickly, because you guys look like you could do some gatorade. It says, um, let there be no compulsion in religion. The right way is henceforth clearly distinct from error. Religion must be, faith must be voluntary. It has to be a choice. It says, had we will, had God will, he could have indeed guided all of you. I thought, why didn't you? Why didn't you just make us clones of one another, spiritual clones, rightly guided? Do not the believers know that had God willed, he could have guided all mankind? Why not? I thought. <laughs> if God had willed, if we had willed, he could have given every soul its guidance. Give it to me. <laughs> Make it clear. Enlightenment has come from your Lord. He who sees does so to his own good. He who is blind is so to his own hurt. It's your choice. You're the one who gets affected, not me. Quran is saying, I don't get affected. It affects you. You can't hurt me in the least. I will tell you, you're only destroying yourself. And whoever is guided is only to his own gain. If there's any stray, say, I am only a warden. Another verse tells has the prophet say, I am not a warden over you. That's not my job. We have revealed to you the book with the truth for mankind. You let himself be guided, does so to his own good. You go astray, does so to his own hurt. Time and time again, it's up to you. It has to come from you. This is your choice. Nobody's going to make it for you. And many such verses, like this one. If it had been your Lord's wish, they all would have believed, all who are on earth. Will you then compel people against their will to believe? And obviously, rejecting tone. No. The object of the game is not to force people to believe. So the Quran talks about the essential choice that we all have to make. You know, the essential role that choice plays. Does it emphasize suffering? Now, suffering is the big one, right? That's, that, is the one, that is the one dilemma for every faith on earth. Does it emphasize suffering? Now, suffering is the big one, right? That's, that, is the one, that is the one dilemma for every faith on earth. Some faiths say you have to transcend it. Some say it's a punishment, primarily. Some say that you've got to be saved from it. Some say this, some say that. But most faiths treat it as something non-positive. What struck me about the Quran, and really annoyed me at first, was the Quran emphasizes the positive benefits of human suffering. And that, in my background, I found very, very provocative. For example, it says, most assuredly I, we will try you with something of danger and hunger and the loss of worldly goods. You are going to suffer. And we will try you with your lives and the fruits of your labor. But give the good news, the glad tidings, the good news to those who persevere, who persevere, who when calamity befalls them say, when calamity befalls them say, truly unto God that we belong and truly unto him we shall return. Give the good news. I read that first. I said, that good news, this appears in the second Torah. Give my brothers the good news. Give my mother the good news. Give Mike Mario, who is gunned down in Bearsley Terrace, one of my friends, the good news. Give his mother the good news. I thought, are you naive? I thought, what's this business about truly unto God? How does this relate to our return to God? I don't mean to be offensive to the Muslims in the audience. I'm just trying to explain to you how it draws you, could draw you, potentially, into this conversation. Do you think that you can enter paradise without having the like of those who passed away before you? Misfortune and, be and hardship befell them, and so shaken were they that the apostle and the believers with him, these are good people, would explain, when will God's help come? And then it says, oh truly, God's help is always near. See, these very virtuous people, their suffering is so severe that they 
almost at the brink of collapse. And then, but God's help is always near. He's close. Hang in there. Do you think that you could have to paradise without having suffered like they did? I thought, why not? Beam us up, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> you will certainly be tried in your possessions and yourselves. In other words, every soul must taste of death. And we try you with calamity and prosperity, both as a need of trial. But to us you will return. How does that even relate to our return? Oh man, truly you've been toiling towards your Lord in painful toil, but you shall need him. How does toiling on earth and suffering bring us closer to God? I was in the dark. Just explain it to me, please. I kept wanting it through my mind. We certainly have created man to face hardship. You created us to face hardship? We have made, you made us to face hardship? To experience hardship? Is it our nature to experience hardship? What, are you trying to say we seek it? When things are easy, we look for more and more difficult challenges? Is this in our nature? Do we grow from it? Do we evolve from it? Does he think that no one has power over him? He goes, yeah, obviously, he's saying a lot of us think are slogging away down here, and we think we're just down here for nothing. He will say, I have wasted much wealth at the end of his life. Does he think that no one sees him? That we put you down here for no reason at all? Have we not given him two eyes to see with, and a tongue and two lips, obviously, to communicate with? And pointed out to him the two conspicuous ways. Open up your eyes and say, talk to others. See what life is all about from other people's experiences. Look at the people that are happy. Look at the people that are not. Look at those that are serene. Look at those that are miserable. Talk. Look. See. Use your eyes. I'm not yelling at you guys. I'm just <laughs> explaining. I'm trying to make it not too boring. <laughs> but he attempts not the uphill climb. Kron is describing a successful life as an uphill climb, a mountainous climb. The Arabic word is al -akaba. It's like going up a mountain, climbing a mountain. But he attempts not the uphill climb. And what will make you comprehend the uphill climb? What is life all about? It's an uphill climb. What is the uphill climb? Next verse, to free a slave, or to feed in a day of hunger an orphan nearly related, or the poor one lying in the dust. What is life all about? Reaching out to your suffering fellow brothers and sisters in humanity. No reference is made to the, what their religious beliefs are. That's what your life is all about. It's not the cars, it's not the suits, it's not the money, according to this verse. <laughs> it's about reaching out to others. Then he or she is of those who believe. Then. He or she is of those who exhorts one another to patience, to perseverance, and exhorts one another to mercy. That's what life is all about, the Quran is saying. I said, I don't get it. I, but it remembered, when I was reading this, I was reminded of my mom. Because my mom used to always tell me, Jeff, life is not about, it's not about getting. It's not about taking. It's about giving. If you want to have happiness in life, you have to learn to give to others, to reach out to others. It's not my nature. Because I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Life was about survival. I used to say that to my mother. I used to say, Mom, I don't know what planet you're living on. Because when I go out that door, it's not about giving. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Just walking from here to the schoolyard, I've got to make sure I bring a baseball bat or some similar weapon <laughs> so I can get there in one piece. And I said, you know, Gus and, and Mike Mario died and Gus was beaten to, to bits the other day and, and I won't mention their names but you know several other friends were taken to the hospital after a gang fight. It's not about giving. It's about getting to the top. It's about and if you have to, climb over the carcasses of the other failures on the way. But I was, you know, I was 18 at the time. But now when I read this verse, I was reminded of my mom, and I was almost at the end of the Quran. I thought about it, but you know, I'll tell you the truth. My mom was a very happy person. She was at peace. She was serene. She loved her life. She, as bizarrely as that sounds, she had such a positive.
positive attitude. And she had so much joy. And she was living with an unending nightmare. And my dad, who lived by my philosophy, he was a tortured individual. And when I thought of others like them, I saw the same. The people that had the most joy and happiness in life were those who were the followed my mom's philosophy, this philosophy. And the people that didn't were the people that felt, followed my creed. But still, I was at the end of the car, I couldn't figure it out. Okay, yeah, I agree with you. You know, reaching out to others, giving to others, you know, some sacrifice. Yes, it might give you serenity and peace and make your life more joyful, but that's what it's all about. The Michael Jackson song says, to just make the world a better place for you and me. <laughs> Why do we have to suffer? Why do we need intellect? Why do we need to have this ability to choose? Why did God just program us to be that way? I still couldn't see it. And now I'm almost at the end of the Quran. Then I have verses like these in the Quran. It says, uh, Oh, our Lord, raise up in their midst a messenger from among themselves who will recite to you your signs, and to recite to them your signs, and teach them the book and the wisdom, and cause them to grow. Grow? What are we growing towards here? That kind of statement is made several times in the Quran. For example, to this one, and the soul and that which breathed into it, its immorality and its God consciousness. Truly he is indeed successful who causes it, himself, to grow. And truly he is a failure who stunts, who stunts it, who stunts his own growth. Notice how it's putting all the responsibility on the person. But God says, you destroy yourselves. You stunt your own growth. What are we growing towards, I thought? We're growing. Okay, we're down here to grow. There's many, there's like 12 such times it's mentioned in the Quran that we're here to grow. To grow towards what? Well, you're here to grow closer to God, the Quran says. How do you grow closer to God? God is infinite. We're finite. He's way up there somewhere, out of here, transcending time and space. How do we get closer to God? We're vulnerable. He's not. We're finite. He's infinite. How do you go closer to a being that's totally unlike us? You, in order to go some, closer to somebody, you have to share something with them. What do we really share with God? Are you getting me? You, in order to go some, closer to somebody, you have to share something with them. What do we really share with God? Are you getting me? Far removed from suffering in the next life will be the righteous who give, give their wealth so that they may grow. What are we supposed to grow toward? I'm really speeding things up here, you know. And yet the Quran insists that we're here for a purpose. We have not created the heavens and earth and whatever is between them in sport. If we wished to take a sport, we could have done it ourselves if God really needed to entertain himself. Since if we were to do that at all. But we put you here for a purpose. Do you think we created you purposely and that you'll not be returned to us? We did not create the heavens and earth and all that's between them in play. We did it for a purpose. Just tell me what it is. Just write it down like a theorem, I thought, you know? <laughs> like a thesis. You know? Okay, maybe nobody else will read it, because it'll be so so terribly boring. They won't understand it. I'll appreciate it. Write it down like a philosophical treatise. And I'll read it, I promise. You know, that's what I was thinking. But the Quran, you know, just wants you to discover these things within yourself. Because everybody has a different question. Everybody has different issues. But how is it going to guide me to that? So why do the how do we grow closer to God? And why do we grow closer to God? And what's the whole purpose of it all? And then I remember these verses. Yet there are men who take others besides God as equal, loving them as they should love God. But those who believe love God more ardently. In other words, if you love God, follow me, and God will love you and forgive your faults, for God is the forgiving, the mercy. In another verse, oh, you who believe, any from among you should turn back from this faith, then God will assuredly bring another people he loves and who love him. And consistently, the Quran will describe the true believer as once he loved. He loves the giving. He loves the merciful. He loves the charitable. He loves, you know, the generous, the just, the kind, and so forth and so on. Okay, so we're here to grow to God. 
and to develop a relationship of love with God, to turn to God in love, and he turns to us in love, and we form this very intimate relationship with God. So I wrote that down in my notebook. I really did. Develop relationship with God of love. Relationship with God of love. Okay? So I wrote that down. I said, okay. Does any of this make sense? Okay, I understand. You live a good life. You live a self-sacrificing life. You reach out to others. You help your fellow man. You make that your canons of, li of living. It brings you peace and serenity. I buy that. Two, uh, we're here to develop a relationship of love with God. If he's our creator, of course. I mean, why else would he create us? I mean, of course, he wants to bring us closer to him, wants us to have this relationship with love. It makes sense. He's a loving God. We're going to be the objects of his love and vice versa. It makes sense. But then why put us here on earth? Are you following me? Why put us here on earth? I couldn't see it. And the sad thing was, I was at the end of the Quran. I still couldn't see it. And I came up empty. And at the end of the speech, no. Uh, no. It's almost. It's almost the end of the speech. Several people just walked out. But it's not quite the end of the speech, but it's almost the end of the speech. Because then it came upon me very quickly. But, you know, I was sitting there in Diamond Heights one day thinking, you know, I had to finish the Quran. I couldn't find it, the answer. And I thought that uh, the author made a brilliant attempt. He kept me glued to the Quran the entire script. I finished it in about two months. I used to read it while walking up and down the hills of Diamond Heights. My friends that would see me thought I was nuts. Jeff, what are you doing? I'm reading. While walking? Yeah. What are you reading? The Quran. Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> well, in any case. But still, I came up empty. And that was a hollow victory, I'll be honest. I had no sense of satisfaction, even though I was an atheist. Because honestly, to be honest with you, this is not an argument or anything, but there were moments when I was reading the Quran, I was so sure that that voice reaching out to me was God. I felt like it had awakened a spirituality in me that I had long denied. I felt a connection to that voice. It was as if it was I was a child, a newborn child, and I was hearing my mother's voice voice I always knew when I was in the womb. And there were times that was so powerful it brought tears to my eyes. I remember crying one time when I read Surah al -Duha. I cried for a good 15-20 minutes after reading that passage, that Surah. And I had spiritual moments when I felt, and this sounds strange, but I felt like I was in the presence of this most merciful, compassionate embrace. It was like I was being hugged, you know, by this infinite hug. And it used to make me cry. And I used to fight it and try to step on it and think, what's psychologically happening to me here? God, <laughs> get rid of this. This cannot be real. I don't even believe in you. Leave me alone. <laughs> but, but like I said, there was no hollow victory. But I just felt that the author, as brilliant as he was, fell short where everybody must fall short in such a tense, and that is that infinite gulf between God and man, yeah. and humanity. It's impossible to bridge that gulf. And so I gave up on the Quran, and I decided that here I am in San Francisco, the most romantic city in the world, and Montreal reminds me a lot of it, to tell you the truth. It's like being in San Francisco again. You know, but, you know, one of the most romantic cities in the world, and I thought, you know, the ratio of straight men to straight women was like one to ten there. <laughs> <laughs> I decided it's time to stop thinking about all this theological stuff and enjoy the real purpose why I came to San Francisco. <laughs> Honestly. So I decided to go for all the gossip. You know, and here I was, you know, trying to enjoy San Francisco and this experience of crime just wouldn't leave. It was haunting. And one night I'm sitting in Diamond Heights, watching my two favorite football teams, the Green Bay Packers and San Francisco, 49ers slug it out. And it's, I love I'm waiting for this game. They're both title contenders. And I'm watching the game, and then all of a sudden, a moment of epiphany. Doesn't it always happen when you're concentrating on something else? 
It came to me. You know? The Quran tells us a great deal about God and a great deal about man and what man's purpose is and what God's purpose is. And I began to write down what it, what it said. What does the Quran require of man? This whole thing is about the relationship of men to God and men and humans, men and women, and humans growing closer to God. I thought, what does the Quran require of the true believer? How does it want him to grow? And I began to think very rapidly. Oh, and I looked up my notes. The Quran wants us to grow in generosity, wants us to be generous, it wants us to be kind, it says it wants us to grow in mercy, it wants to grow us, us to grow in compassion, to develop and teach each other compassion, it wants us to be just, it wants us to be truthful. I began just writing down the list of everything I could think of that the Quran asked us to become. Truthful, kind, generous, bountiful, patient, you know, um, what else? You, you could tell me, God. Uh, defenders of the meat, of the weak and the oppressed, defenders of others, of the weak and the oppressed, wisdom, right? What's that? Peaceful. Peaceful. Loving. Beautiful. Loving. In general, in general, beautiful. Right? What the Quran describes is beautiful. This list goes on and on. Right? What the Quran describes is beautiful. This list goes on and on. You know, and I began to write down everything I could remember. Then I said, now what does the Quran tell us about God? First thing that came to mind, nothing compares to him. There's nothing like un a reason to not embrace and it's entire. Oh, you guys took all the words on earth. You cannot encompass the words of God. You know, even if all the world, all the trees were pens, and all the seas and seven seas added to it, uh, you know, was ink, your words could never uh, circumscribe the words of God. You know, all this, you know, God is infinite. Outside of, you know, anything you can compare him to. I thought, wait a minute, you know, is that it? Is that what the Quran is telling us? And then it dawned on me, wait a minute. Quran tells us a whole great deal about God. But I always, when I was reading, I'd always just sort of skimmed over it. You know, thought it was just literary devices, you know, to punctuate passages or to begin statements. I think you know what I'm talking about. But the Quran talks about God's most beautiful names. You know, they appear on almost every page of the Quran. What does the Quran tell us about God? This, there's thousands of such references, and they're repeated again and again. So as the Muslim reads the Quran, this image of God that begins to build in his mind is not a physical image, but it's an image of attributes, of beauty, of what the Quran describes as the, attributes, the true attributes of beauty. And God, to God belongs, according to the Quran, all the attributes of beauty. He is the source of all that is beautiful. What, what does the Quran tell us about God? It tells us he's the infinitely generous, you know, the infinitely kind. The infinitely merciful. He is the merciful. That's why I say infinitely. He's the source. He is all the mercy comes from God. Compassion. Right? He's compassionate. The compassionate one. The just. You know what I'm going to write here. He is the truth. He, he is, the, you know, he is the clement. You know, he's the defender of the oppressed. Right? He is the wise. The peaceful, or the source of all peace. The loving, al and on and on and on. Are you following? The minute I thought about it, the minute I saw those two lists in front of me, you know, I realized, as I'm writing this list, I'm also writing this one. Everything the Quran asks us to grow in, God is the infinite source. So the more we grow in generosity, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's infinite generosity and to relate to that. The more we grow in kindness, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's kindness here on earth and infinitely more in the next life when all is stripped away. The more we grow, and the Quran tells us when we come into this life, God breathes something of his spirit into us. The seeds of all these things are in us, but as we live our life and make our choices, our moral and spiritual choices, we either nurture those things with God's help, or we stunt them, as the Quran said. So the more we grow in mercy, the more we are able to relate to God's infinite mercy. The more we grow in justice, the more
while we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's infinite justice. Here in this life, it's really more in the end. You know, when I explained this to my children, you know what they said to me? Daddy, that's the lamest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> They're only like 13, 12, and 10 at that time. So I said to them, guys, let me give you an analogy. This only takes a few minutes. I said, let me give you an analogy. I said, okay. Yeah. Let me give you an analogy. Um, I'm just going to write something. Let me give you an analogy. <laughs> Let's say I have two goldfish, which I had when I was a little boy, a dog, which I had when I was a little boy, and three daughters, which I have now. I told you. No matter how much of my being I showered on that goldfish, and I tried to let that goldfish, because I loved that goldfish, I tried to have that goldfish experience all that I was. I, I dolted on that goldfish. I spent hours and hours and hours trying to let that goldfish, talking to that goldfish, loving that goldfish. But you know, I came to realize at some stage that that goldfish, well, it didn't matter I was there or not. <laughs> so you can only experience all that I am to a very small degree, because it's primitive creature. And I told him, my dog Sergeant, that I had such a beautiful German Shepherd, he loved me. You know, he could experience what I was to a much higher degree than the goldfish. Of course, he didn't really understand my ration, my logic. And he didn't understand, you know, a lot of my wisdom as it developed. But he didn't understand my deeper motivations and things like that and all my aspects. But he understood my kindness. He understood my protectiveness, and he appreciated it, and my generosity. You know, he understood those because he protects. He was a protective animal. He is a giving animal to some extent. You know, he's a loving animal to some extent, and he could ex experience my love. But I said, you, my children, are much more complex creatures than my goldfish. The more you grow in your attributes of beauty, the more you'll be able to experience and understand and relate to whatever beauty I, of mine I could impart on you, and vice versa. And I told them, so it is with God. In order to grow closer to some another being, we have to share something with them. So I, if I want to get to you closer physically, I move my body closer to you because we're both bodily creatures. If I want to approach you rationally, I approach you through your intellect, because we're both intellectual beings, through argument. If I want to approach you emotionally, I approach you with sentiments, because we're both emotional beings. How do we grow closer to God? He's not corporeal like we are. You know, he's not finite like we are. But the Quran, the Quran, we grow in beauty, because God is the beautiful. All beauty comes from God. And the more we grow in beauty, the more we grow in, in our ability to receive an experience, like my kids could receive an experience, my beauty. We grow in our ability to receive an experience all that is beautiful. You know, God, the infinite font of all beauty. Are you following me? <laughs> but I said, okay. That makes sense. And then I thought about it. Wait, Jeff, you've been seduced. Because <laughs> it still doesn't explain. Let me go back to the other window. It still doesn't explain. <laughs> it still doesn't, <laughs> still doesn't explain suffering. Right? Why do we need to suffer? Intellect. Why do we need intellect? Choice. Why do we need choice? Why do we have to go through all that? Why didn't God just program us? Pop us in heaven and program us. Make us merciful, compassionate, forgiving, loving, etc. Program us. Are you following me? Well, those of you who are mathematicians in the audience, where are you again? <laughs> good, you make me feel good. <laughs> I feel like I got a little bit of support here. In mathematics, I'm not saying mathematics is great science or mathematicians are great or rational. Come to a department meeting in our department, you'll realize that they're just big babies. <laughs> but, uh, irrational babies. But in mathematics, though, when we actually are doing our science, and we're faced with a proposition, and we're wondering if all the conditions, all the premises are necessary to get to the conclusion. And so what we often do is we remove a premise and see if we can still arrive at the same conclusion. 
And so that's just what I did. I did it naturally. If you take away human intellect, if you take away human suffering, if you take away human choice, then do we experience and come to know, or even experience, let's say, do we even experience, can we even experience compassion? Can we experience and come to know mercy, or justice, or kindness, or love? Are you following me? If you take away choice, does kindness make any sense? I mean, what is compassion? You see a, a person in pain, and what do you do? You make a choice. Do I help that person, or do I make my appointment and get my check for $2,000? Are you following me? It's a choice. And would it even have been possible if human, humans don't face any adversity in life? Of course not. Are you following me? And it's an intellectual choice. We weigh the consequences of these choices we make. Same thing with justice, same thing with love, truth. What is truth without choice? I never heard anybody say, you know, Jeff, that this computer is the most truthful computer on the market. <laughs> it never makes an incorrect statement. We don't understand make, never making an incorrect statement as truth. The minute we say truth, we know it implies choice. This person always chooses to do, say what's right. Are you following me? We don't understand make, never making an incorrect statement as truth. The minute we say truth, we know it implies choice. This person always chooses to do, say what's right. Are you following me? And the greater the adversity when you make that choice, the more truthful you become. It's like the great wedding vow, love. Do you, Jeff Lang, say Gregg Jeff Kendall, that's her name, my wife, beautiful woman. When we went to City Hall to get civilly married also, do you, Jeff Lang, take this woman to be your lawfully little wife in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, until death do you part. My wife, he looked at my wife. What do you say? I do. He looked at me and said, whoa. <laughs> Inside my head, it was a joke. <laughs> my wife was going to kill me. But, you know, he made it sound so weighty, you know? He could take this part, like sickness and poverty, and no matter how hard it gets. But when he said that, he was saying, oh, just what I said. He was emphasizing through suffering, do you understand this choice? Are you using your intellect here? Are you ready to make this choice? Do you do it? One young lady once said to me, Jeff, you never really loved me. Because when the going got tough and things got hard, you just got up and left. And she understood. You know, that that's what, love is not just having a lot of good romance and enjoying each other's company a lot. Real love is pain. It's dealing with the pain and the happiness, and sticking it out, and persevering. Another thing that the crowd emphasizes again and again and again. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. So I'll finish up by saying, you know, that explains why the Quran, in the Quran, sin, when a person sins, they don't mostly destroy God. They don't destroy God at all. They don't even probably, primarily sin against another person. Who is the victim of our sin, mostly, in the Quran? Ourselves. God says you sin against yourself. You commit <coughs> dom, destruction. You commit oppression against yourself. Because every time we do wrong, every time instead of choosing mercy, compassion, etc., we choose its an antithesis, we destroy ourselves. And we don't grow in the direction where we can experience all that is beautiful in this life and the next, and in particular God's being. We grow in a direction that's antithetical to that, and we suffer horribly. Because it's as if, well, I don't want to get into it beyond that. So the time just is not for me. You'll have to read my book. I'll leave you with one last example of things. Because I want to emphasize that even if you read my book, I'm sure you're going to come up with theological questions that that book doesn't answer. Guaranteed. As many questions as there are people in the world. But the important thing is, just because you can't answer a question doesn't mean the, an answer, a rational answer, is out there. You know, I think it's important to remember that. So I've had people email me and say, I have this question, and I haven't been able to answer it. And they say, can you answer it? And I, I write back, no. You know, and then they feel, oh, then why should I believe? Well, because I'm not that smart. You know? <laughs> but I'll give you an example. 
Once my daughter Jamila, and I'm going to end with this because I love this story and I love my daughter. And she taught me a lot. Sometimes as parents, our children come to us and they ask us these type of questions, and especially Muslim parents, and they freak out. You know, because kids tell me, I asked my father this question, he totally freaked out. You know, told me I was a cat. But sometimes it's better just to talk it out with them and be patient and admit that, you know, you don't know. So Jamila comes to me one night, I'm tucking her in, I already tucked her two sisters in, now I'm tucking Jamila in. I'm saying, honey, can I eat pizza? And then she says, Daddy, I have a question. I think, oh, there we go. Up till midnight. Jamila just never lets go of a question. She's the genius in the family. So I said, yes, what's your question, honey? Then she said, Daddy, you know, I understood, you know, your explanation of the purpose of life and what you got from the Quran. And it's coherent. She didn't use the word coherent. It's coherent. It makes sense. You know, the pieces fit together. She still says, I got a question. It's just gnawing at me, and I can't figure out the answer. And I said, well, sometimes, you know, those things come later in life. You know, just keep working on it. You know, put it on a shelf. You know, you'll be surprised what the experiences of life can teach. So she said, can I try it with you? I said, uh, okay. <laughs> I said, Daddy, why does God let little children suffer? I could, I could understand adults, right? They have the intellect and everything, and they could learn from it and grow from it, etc. But what about like two-year-old babies? Five-year-old kids never did a wrong thing in their life. Don't even have the maturity to, to grow from these experiences. Why would he let children suffer terrible calamity, death even? This doesn't make sense. Now, when you ask about the children, you know, and you're asking a parent, and the, your whole life is about protecting and nurturing those love buckets you have. You know, it's just overwhelming, that question. I told her, frankly, honey, I don't know. But I tell you what, I'll give you some advice. You know, maybe someday you'll figure it out. If you've got a question like that, a good thing to often do if you already have this sort of understanding of life and you're trying to make, fit it in with that or see if it makes sense by that, you know, if you got something like that, assume the opposite. Assume the opposite. And see if it fits with how you understand life and our existence. Are you following me? She said, not at all. I said, let me give you an example. And let's assume that it's not as you said. Assume, assume just the opposite. Children are in bone. God made it so that children could never suffer up until a certain age. What's, what age would you like to say when ch childhood ends? I don't know, Daddy. Pick your, I, I said 18? She said, fine, 18. I said, okay, up till 18, a child could never suffer. No disease, nothing. You know? No illness, can't die. Children are in vulnerable up to them, then after that, vulnerability kicks in, and after that, they're just like everybody. I said, then, how would that fit with how we understand the purpose of life as I just described it? Would it make any sense? You know, this purpose of life that even you said seems coherent. And I didn't, exp you know, I said, you know, this might take years for us to figure out, but it's just a good thing to do when you're faced with such dilemma. So I said, let's just try to think about it for the next 20, 30 minutes. We'll talk about it, and then after that, we'll pursue it at a later time. You know, because I said, frankly, I don't have the answer. I'm looking like this, I'm pondering the question. We're both quiet. And all of a sudden I hear her voice. She said, Daddy? I said, uh, yes, sir. She said, I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I, she got it? I've been thinking about it for 15 minutes, but I'm not, don't even have a clue. I know she can't be any nearer. I look at her and I say, yeah, go ahead. I think I'm humoring my daughter. Yeah, go ahead. She said, Daddy, I think of it as the way you said it was. You know, that Children couldn't suffer at all until they're 18, can't experience any disease or anything. Completely involved. I said, yeah, yeah, what? She said, then mommies and daddies really wouldn't need to be mommies and daddies anymore. So, you know, I mean, she wasn't saying that mommies and daddies wouldn't need to give birth anymore. She was saying that parenting would be robbed of all its value. Are you following? Because like, in Islam, Parenting is one of our major venues for spiritual growth. We have more opportunities, such tremendous opportunity to grow in mercy, compassion, forgiveness, etc. 
through parenting, through our relationship with our families and our children, in almost any other venue. Are you following me? My daughter was saying, kids are vulnerable to 18. Parents wouldn't need to be parents anymore. And so they would be deprived of that experience and wouldn't have all that love. For that. Is there any other relationship in your life where you experience more selfless love, compassion, forgiveness, etc., than a relationship between a parent and a child? And in turn, they absorb it. They don't realize it, but they absorb that whole experience of your love, compassion, etc., and they come to know it. Even when they're six months old, when you're hugging them and caressing them and breastfeeding them, etc., they are developing an understanding of that comfort, that love, that nurture, and it sticks with them their whole life, and they yearn for it, and then later yearn to give it to others. Are you following me? So, I don't know if you understood her question, or her answer, but she taught me. She taught me. And a lot of times we can learn from listening to our children. In any case, you guys have got to be exhausted, because I know I am. So, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. You don't have to ask any questions, by the way. <laughs> yes, sir. How well, when I was an atheist, what was my theory of the existence of the world? Yeah, and why did you reject it? Like, what, what, uh, how could you keep a consistent explanation of the, the world's existing without rejecting your previous theories? Well, when I was an atheist, I couldn't find your questions. I heard the first part. When I was an atheist, you know, when people of a religious nature used to ask me, you know, well, who created the world? You know the response. I said, who do you think created the world? They said, God. And then you know what I would say. Who created God? They would say, no, God has always been. And then I said, well, why couldn't the universe have always been? You know, so that was my explanation. You know, it's not like I just read it and said, aha. You know, it was so powerful, it was so infinite. And I felt, finally, that God had spoken to me through the Quran and, and opened a spirituality up inside me that Made, awakened me to a spirituality I thought I never had. I mean, that experience was so dramatic and powerful. I couldn't live without that in my life. Are you following the Quran? I continued to read it daily from there on out. After a while, it became clear to me that not, uh, it's strange how it actually happened. I won't go into detail here. But to make a long story short, it was obvious that I had to join the community that honored that scripture. But that was a difficult time joining that community, you know, because it's dominated by many foreign cultures, depending on what mosque you go to, and they have their own particular cultural perspective on things, and they often equate that with the revelation itself, and that could be very exasperating and frustrating for somebody coming from the outside. But I won't go into that in detail. But nonetheless, it's because of the love of that, you know, that whole experience. You know, and the role that the Quran has played, I had to stay close to that. I have a question. Yes. Sir. Yeah, I think you told uh, when you were in Purdue University, you did get into Buddhism, Hinduism, and things like that. Say that again. Uh, when you were in Purdue University, yeah. you came across the faith in Hinduism, Buddhism, and things like that. Uh, did you go through a book named Bhagavad Gita? I, I read a little, you know, I read an English translation of it, a little bit. Just, just to better understand my friends. You know, that's what I do when I meet people from other faiths or things like that, even to this day, you know, particular religious perspective. A lot of times I'll just, or not just that, I'll read about their culture or things like that, especially if I like them. But yes. you didn't find any answer in those books uh, which haunted you in the beginning, like why God is so merciful and things like that? Being merciful, why the word? No, it was very difficult for me, you know, okay. for that. Because, you know, Buddhism, I mean, Hinduism has, you know, so many scriptures. You know, and the scriptural literature is so vast. And it represents so many perspectives. It's difficult for somebody from the outside, yeah, you know, to come and read that and, and find guidance from it. You know what I mean? Unless you happen to stumble on the right thing. You know, but yeah, for me it was a little bit confusing. You know? And that's not to put it down. It's just that, you know, scriptures and Buddhism and Hinduism could fill, you know, my office, the math department, even more, maybe four times that. 
you know, so you really need to do it. It would be very difficult, you know, without somebody to help guide you through the process. And, you know, none of my friends in that faith knew it well enough to even deal with my questions. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, because, you know, and, you know, coming from a Christian background, you know, after I became a Muslim, I understood that, oh, there are parts of the Bible that very much agree with what I'm saying and that point in the same direction. But I read the Bible twice before ever becoming a Muslim. I read it cover to cover twice. Just couldn't find it. You know, so I feel it's there. But, you know, some people will be guided by this, some people will be guided by that. You know, Thank you. Yes. Dr. Lang, just thank you for your lecture. Yes. Um, I'm a student of theology and a Christian myself. I hope I didn't say anything that offended you. No, you didn't. <laughs> um, I have a theological question for you, though. Okay. I can't answer it I don't know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> But in Christian theology, we uh, believe that God is both merciful and just to the attributes that you wrote on the board. Yeah. Um, but we believe that the basis of God's uh, mercy, that the fact that he can forgive us, is based on the fact that he fulfilled his requirement for justice in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Yes. How in Muslim theology do you reconcile the two, that God can be, uh, extend mercy without violating his requirement for justice? Well, see, because, you know, if you remember, did you get here in the beginning of the lecture? Mm -hmm. See, in Christian theology, that whole question, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, begins with the story of Adam, right? Yeah. And the story of Adam emphasizes that he sinned and that that had to be, that had to be, uh, uh, what's the word you said again? Uh, in terms of justice. That had to be reconciled in terms of justice. Right. But in the Quran, if you remember, as I was saying, there's no indication in that version of the Quran of that story that that was a, that big a deal. Are you following me? It was in the Quran, Adam slipped. It's a minor thing. God didn't put us here as a punishment. Are you following me? So God is not, God did not feel violated or his, or anything had been violated to such a degree that's, that that had to be paid for. Adam, Adam, I'm just saying from the standpoint of Quran. Adam repented, God forgave Adam and Eve, and that's it. Because they're not really here as a punishment. They're here to grow. This is a stage, from the standpoint of Quran, we weren't just created when we were conceived. We are actually going through a stage of our creation here and now. So it's a different point of view. You know, so the issue of God needing to be, uh, his, his sense of justice needing to be satisfied. Uh, that's not the deal as far as uh, the story of Adam is concerned. But in, in Muslim theology, is there not a theology of punishment in hell as well as Muslim theology that God yes. punishes sin? Yes. Well, it, but it, like I said, it's very much tied to an individual's self-destruction. You know what I'm saying? There's an organic relationship. I don't want to get too deep into it here because I didn't talk about this a lot. and it, This takes a long conversation. But there's an organic relation between a person's doings and what they're going to experience in the next life. I'll try to explain it this way. Do you guys mind me talking about this? I'll try to explain it this way. Our growth in the womb, for example, is primarily physical growth. I'm going to use that analogy first. We grow in the womb. If we grow healthily and grow well, then when we come into this world, we come in as healthy individuals physically and are able to experience physical beauty and comfort. If somehow, that growth in the womb is disturbed, or retarded, or destroyed, then we could come into this world in physical anguish. Are you following me? Maybe come into this world without skin. And then the elements and the cold and the hot tortures us. Are you following me? We come into this world deformed and experience all kinds of physical handicap and, and suffering. Are you following me? In the same way, our growth in this life is primarily spiritual, not physical. We grow physically for a while, then we decline physically. But in the Quran, the type of growth we experience in this life is mostly spiritual. We grow in beauty. Or we don't grow in beauty. We grow in ugliness. And through that growth, we can e either experience tremendous beauty in the next life that awaits us, or we can experience tremendous suffering. It's as if, if we destroy ourselves, to use the Quran's terminology, if we destroy ourselves in this life and grow 
in attributes that are antithetical to the ones that I just wrote down, then we are preparing for ourselves our own suffering. So in the Quran it says, God says to the people when they enter the next life, I did not hurt you in the least, but you did destroy yourselves. Are you following me? In the Quranic imagery, and it is imagery, it says that person, their deeds in this life are tied to them in the next life. And their very being testifies to what the kind of life they lived here. Their skins, their hands, they, they use these metaphors. You know, everything about them testifies to what kind of lives they live. It shows in their very being in the next life, an organic, in natural link. Are you following me? So in the Quran, yeah, I mean, of course God's justice is intimately tied to how he has created us. And he comes to our aid, and he helps us, and things like that when we repent. He's still, though, those choices, that growth, we have, to, we have to engage ourselves in it, and we have to take it seriously. But if we destroy ourselves, it's actually we who have destroyed ourselves. It doesn't violate God's justice at all. Are you following? Very good question, though. Excellent question. Uh, thank you for uh, the lecture again. But that whole thing takes a lot more explanation, by the way. I wrote about that a lot in my second book, Even Angels Asked. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you... Uh, but that's what I got from it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm the final word. But, you know, I've always read literature. I have a tendency to read literature in that way. I take a very literary approach where it's right. Yes, go ahead. One last thing. No. <laughs> yourself at all, uh, like, uh, how do I verify that it's really the, the truth, or I mean, the true word of God? Uh, did you go through that process, and if so, then no. was, was whatever you read, I guess, whatever you explained, just uh, sufficient enough to, to prove to you that this is actually the word of God? You know, after I became a Muslim, you know, people tried to prove to me that the Quran, Muslims tried to prove to me that the Quran was... You know, like you said, the Word of God. They try to prove to me in other ways. Some use the, the science in the Quran or the Quranic signs from science, you know, sort of scientific signs. But to be honest with you, they're, they're written in such a way, they're very beautiful, very compelling, very powerful once you believe. But if you're a non-believer, you know, if you approach them from the standpoint of a non-believer, they're not written in scientific specificity that it would be utterly convincing, you know, to a non from somebody outside. You know, the other day I got an email from somebody and they said, I sent this, like, uh, this scholar of physics in England you know, a note for me telling him that I want to show him the signs in the Quran for physics and that this proves the Quran is the word of God. The scholar wrote back and said, oh, come on, you know, that's ridiculous. Don't even bother me with that. Unless they're written in scientific accurate, mathematical accuracy, to a degree of mathematical accuracy that a mathematician would be forced to say that that's, are you following me? Mm -hmm. And I told him, yeah, I wrote back to him and said, of course. You know, then, you know it is a sign, but it's a sign. It's not, you know, empirical proof. You know, it makes you wonder. It opens up your imagination. It forces you to think. You know, as all the Quran signs do. But ultimately, you've got to make a choice along the way. But others told me about the history of the Quran, how it was collected, and things like that. And, you know, I studied the Hadith literature about it. And there's conflicting stories about how, how that was had. It got more comfortable. The more I studied, the more confused I got. But in any case, I didn't need any of that. You know, I read the Quran, I had this, what happened was, and I'll explain it simply, you know, and I think something like this has to happen if you're an atheist. I read the Quran, I had these powerful spiritual experiences. As the Quran began to chip away at my arguments against the existence of God, brick by brick, brick by brick, they began to fall apart. As that happened, it turned out, somehow, I started to become slightly more open to the message of the Quran. I started to think that maybe I'm wrong about the non-existence of God. Are you following me? I didn't say I am wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Once that started happening, I noticed the verses in the Quran, certain passages of this very spiritual passage, started to affect me in very powerful ways. And like I said, I tried to fight it, I tried to deny it, I tried to explain it away. The further I got through the Quran, the more powerful that became. Especially, you notice, as you come towards the end of the Quran, the emotive style of the Quran increases. The Quran reaches a spiritual, 
an emotive crescendo as you reach towards the end of the Quran. It builds throughout the Quran. You get to the end, it's like it's an arc, you know, like if you were listening to an arc of it's getting more and more powerful, and it's getting there, it's coming. And then finally it says, you know, come on now, say it! You know? <laughs> he is God, the one and only, the eternally sought before. Say it, I seek protection. Believe me, you need, think you need the protection because you know, you might, you're facing a very big choice. I seek, I seek protection of the God of every new day's dawn. Say, I seek protection of the God of mankind. You know, this is, it's, it's like it's saying, finally, okay, here we go. Say, say, say. It literally says, say it. <laughs> That's the way I was reading it. I was experiencing this thing as if it was talking to me. What do you want out of me? What do you want out of me? <laughs> but I was going through this amazing experience. I was having this conversation with something beyond me. Are you following me? This very powerful spiritual conversation that was moving me in ways that I was denying, but was happening anyway. So at the end, that was my conviction. You know? At the end, I became convinced that that voice reaching out to me, that awakened me, you know, by the time I was finished, I knew I was talking to none other than God. That's not proof for anybody else, but it's proof for me. You know, I couldn't deny what happened. So that's the way it happened. You know, so I didn't need any further proofs. But again, the arguments about the science of the Quran, I don't think you're referring to that, or by the way the Quran was collected and preserved. You may have been referring to that. I don't know what you're but none of that really mattered to me. I, you know. Once you once you start having spiritual moments, because then after that I braced this down. Spiritual moments for people that experience them, and I'm sure many of you, since you're believers here, did. Once you start having those, and they are powerful, and they are real, but only you know that, a lot of these questions are becoming irrelevant, don't they? You know what I'm saying? But what could get you to that? How do you get to those? The Quran took you to those. Are you following me? So, that's my answer to your question. But a very good question. Yeah. No, it doesn't satisfy people, but it's definitely helpful. How long after you read the Quran did you become Muslim? And also, um, like, what did your Saudi friends that were not so like practicing? <laughs> what did they do when like you became Muslim? And like, what was the reaction? Well, the reaction was uh, they were excited. You know, my mom, the guy who took me to the San Francisco bar scene. <laughs> He started coming to the mosque to see if I really did convert to Islam. <laughs> I didn't tell, I didn't tell him. And he heard about it, and he said, you're kidding. He said to the other Saudis, you're joking. You know, this, there was a Saudi bar crowd that I always used to hang around with. <laughs> you didn't hear about you. What? You became a Muslim. I would say, no, you're S-H-I-T-ing me. <laughs> no, you're kidding me. No, and he said, really? So he started coming to see if I was there, he's, and he found me there. And, you know, and he became very devout after that. He <laughs> <laughs> did, really. And uh, most of the members of the family, but they were kids, you know, they were going through the wayward years of youth. They were probably going to get there anyway. But they, they became, they're all very, you know, they're very, they're very uh, moderate, but they're very, you know, they're very devout people, but very nice. About, not the severe kind. Because you know? a lot of religious people, we miss, you know, we confuse severity with religiosity. Oh, look at that person. He's so mean and he's religious. He's not, you know, he must be really religious. <laughs> Thank you. Well, are you tired? You want to go home? Okay. Sorry. If there are any more questions, doesn't seem to be any more questions. More details of this are written in my my uh, three books. I'm not encouraging you to buy them, honestly. Although my publisher would love them if I did. <laughs> but uh, if you're interested, I guess even Angels Ask talks a little bit more about this, these theological issues quite a bit. And uh, Losing My Religion, A Call for Help has a chapter, it's about 100 pages long, that also discusses this. I think the two combined, you know, pretty much contain most of my thoughts on that, up to that stage of my life. Of course, as you grow, and you learn and you experience. It keeps enriching your understanding of these issues. Oh, one last question. Thank you for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, may, may, uh, briefly, what people know who, who have never read the Quran, 
what they know about Quran is the stories about war and fighting and the story about women. Could you uh, comment this to the <laughs> War and fight. <laughs> yes, you know, there's a verse in the Quran, you know. Fight, you know, fight them in line, wait and ambush, whatever. In the ninth source, sort of the Toba, verse 5, has a very warring tone. It talks about making war on certain people. It's often quoted by people who have a grudge against Islam and say, see, Islam promotes violence. But if you look just before that, it's very clear, the verses just before that and after that, speak about people who have treaty obligations with the Muslims, peace treaty obligations, and then they break them and they violate those treaties and commit aggression against the Muslims. They were fighting for their self-survival at that time, and self-defense. And so it talks about people who break their treaties and this is how you deal with them. You know, and it has a very bellicose tone. And when that verse was revealed, the tribes that were the enemies of the Muslims at that time, that were trying to exterminate this new community. Uh, when they heard that very bellicose tone, you know, they, they, were, they had their spies inside Medina. And they immediately went and told you know, the, pro the enemies, the enemy tribes, you know, the disbelievers, so this is their relation, Gabe, they're coming at you. <laughs> Listen what it said. The end result was it led to the peace, peaceful conquest of Mecca. And very little bloodshed. Virtually none. So actually, the end result was peaceful. In it. But the long and the short was that it, so it justified violence only against aggression. And in that particular context, because you're going to often hear that verse recited, the fifth verse of Surah Al Tawbah, just read the verses before and after. It talks about, the context is quite clear, about those who break their treaties. And it says about those who don't break their treaties. Keep your peaceful relations with them and honor those treaties. Uh, and that's silly. The, you know, just to give you an example, in the Quran, some have tried to make out the case that the Quran endorses violence and aggression. Some Muslims have. And when they do that, I remember that in their argument they had to write that that verse that I just mentioned canceled 254 verses of the Quran enjoining peace <laughs> and only fighting in self-defense, you know, with the non-Muslims. 254 verses that had to cancel. That's a good indication of what the Quran really says. You know, to have to make that sort of massive cancellation, you can be sure that it must be violating the kind of what the Quran uh, says in general. You know, Quran says, don't commit aggression, you know. Even says, you know, somebody, if they seek peace, you seek peace. And don't worry about it, God, God will defend you, you know. Even because a lot of times we think, oh, now that they seek peace, jump on them, now kill them, wipe them out. This is our chance. You know, the Quran says, they seek peace, you seek peace. You know, God is the best of defending you. But the long and the short of it is, I'm just trying to run through this quick. The Quran really, as far as I understand it, and I think almost any objective reader would, if you look at all the verses, and that's the way you should approach the Quran. When you're dealing with any subject, get out all the verses that deal with it. Massive, you know, amount of verses, joining, only fighting in uh, self-defense or against variable oppression. Now uh, let's see, what was the other one about women? Oh, that's a long subject. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired, but yeah, you know, there's very, there's very little legislation in the Quran. Uh, again, it's a matter of how you interpret it, through what cultural lens you interpret it. If you, you know, sure, you can interpret the verses again about women in the Quran. You know, that have to do of a legislative capacity, dealing with problems that existed in seventh century Arabia at that time. You can interpret it. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, you can take almost any scripture, and if you want to find, if you want to justify oppression of women, or if you want to, I'm not even going to say oppression. A, cur a certain perspective that you have, cultural perspective, you can usually make out an argument. There are often tenuous arguments that you can make it out. But a lot of that is determined, a lot of ways, you have to, we have to face the fact that, you know, first of all, a lot of the claims against Islam simply are true when it comes to that issue. And some are. You know, some of the scholars in the past inter interpreted the the faith in a very old-fashioned way. They were products of their time and place. 
and the assumptions of that time and place. We have a right and a duty to go back and look at those interpretations and critique them. Because we have 1,400 years of, well, we have hundreds of years of experience since. To see if those interpretations make sense, to see if they're tenuous, to critique them and to be self-critical. And that kind of research is currently being done and more of it needs to be done. The only I'm sure of it is, though, I don't believe that true, the message of the Quran is oppressive towards women. Just the kind of thing. But it would take me some time to argue that. So, uh, the question is, if God uh, has sent humans on Earth, then, on Earth, then uh, where does the uh, evolution process fit in, or does it fit in at all? Yeah, you know, the Muslims argue about that a lot. A lot of Muslims feel that argue, you know, the concept of the evolution of species violates the Quran. And then there's others that believe it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? It's just like people that read the Bible. Some people read the Bible and say, yep. That story of creation is not an allegory or is not a parable. It is historical fact. It's about the origins of homo sapiens. You know, uh, people read the Quran. The Quran says it uses allegory and parable. In my second book, Losing My Religion, I argue that the story of Adam in the Quran, I take as a parable. I don't think it has to do with the scientific origins of human beings. And I, and I explain why I believe that from other verses in the Quran that deal with the subject. You could disagree with me, you could agree with me, but the long and the short of it is that personally, I don't see the Quran arguing for or against evolution. Frankly, I know the theory. I think there are some flaws in it. Scientists are still working on it. But without a doubt, life forms on Earth have changed over time. Things that existed in the past no longer exist and newer species are, have come into existence. The exact process for that, we really don't know. But from the Muslim perspective, however God made that come to be, whatever process he made that come to be, uh, we're sure that he was the ultimate author behind it. You know, but for me personally, I don't have a problem with you know, scientists trying to understand the mechanism of how that gradual replacement of one species by another species by another species, how that took place. You know, but I think we have a long way to go to understanding that. But personally, I don't, I, I don't agree with those who say that, you know, uh, you know, scientific theories that explain it are necessarily uh, refuted by the Quran. You know, I, I don't, I, I can see verses in the Quran that support the idea that human life has evolved, uh, life has evolved. Doesn't say what the mechanism behind it was, but I'm sure God was behind it ultimately. Uh, and there are verses that, if you take them literally, you know, s certain stories in the Quran, if you take them lit literally and believe it's talk talking about science rather than just a story to help, a symbolic story to convey unto us meaning, then you could see it another way. You know, it's really up to the individual. Does that help? Yeah, that's the way I do. I believe there are three other people who want to ask questions. We'll cut it off after that. There's one person on this side. I believe there are two people here. So let's cover one person here. Then we'll follow up with the questions from this side. And then lastly, uh, the lady. Yes, brothers and sisters, friends, brothers and sisters, whatever. If you're tired, you can go. I, I know I think I want to. So please, you're not going to fight. Most of so, people are so mm -hmm. hospitable and so sensitive about those questions. Yes? Um, I don't. Um, what partially influenced your decision to join Islam, uh, from my understanding of your lecture, was that you were able to relate it to something personal, like an experience you had in, as a child. Um, do you think the Quran is general enough so that everybody can relate it in that way or in any other way to themselves or their experiences? Well, that's Having a good question. That's a good question. Is that your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Quran general enough that everybody should be able to relate to it or be guided by it. Yeah, God only knows. You know, God only knows. You know, well, I mean, to be honest with you, take my mom. My mom, very sincere person, very truthful. 
person truly surrenders her life as best she can to God. She didn't get all involved in the theology of you know, Christology. And it was beyond her. She was a brilliant woman, but it was beyond anything that she could do. She wasn't a theologian. She said, I'm not a theologian. I don't really fully understand things, but I know this God, I love God, and I believe in my religion. You know, that's the way she explained it. It's my vehicle for experiencing God's grace, she used to say. Well, when, she, when I became a Muslim, that became quite a challenge for her. You know, and, are you following you guys? And so we began discussing it, and she said, wow, you know, this is... First she started arguing against me, and then she started saying, I have great respect for your religion, and it makes a lot of sense, and things like that. And she said, where can I go and experience your community? So I took her to the mosque in San Francisco. I took her to the ladies' community in San Francisco, because they didn't allow women in the mosque in San Francisco. I took her to the ladies' community. She experienced, I didn't know what she was experiencing. I can't go back there. This was in San Francisco. It's not like that in all communities, but at that time. They were imposing a particular sort of cultural version of Islam. I mean, cultural perspective of Islam. And my mother, you know, had a horrible experience. You know, just utterly horrible. She said to me, Jeff, there is no room in this religion for somebody like me. I, I would be spiritually dead. I, I, I am so offended by what happened, you know, that I would feel totally alienated. Are you following me? Now, my mom, but what I'm trying to say is, so my mom is very sincere, was a very sincere seeker of faith. And she sensed that there were some things about Islam that were very compelling. But she wasn't like me. My mom wasn't the type to do everything on an intellectual level. You know, my mom did things on an experiential level as well. And when she experienced the community, she became, became convinced that this religion, her religion might not be 100% perfect. perfect. Because every religion has a theology, it has the human element involved in its interpretation and its implementation. And on that level, she felt that uh, the Muslim community was not a better vehicle for her and, sp and, and her spiritual growth than the community she grew up in. Are you following? A lot of times, you know, a person's ability to perceive truth is based on their background, on their gifts God has given them, and on who they meet. Because, you know, like the first time I experienced the Muslim community, my first introduction to Islam was a friend named Muhammad at Purdue University. He was from the Middle East. When I asked him about Islam, he told me that in Islam, it's bad for a man to commit adultery, but it's much, much worse for a woman to commit adultery. <laughs> now, if I ended up never becoming a Muslim because I thought that that is the worst possible religion on earth, you know, I really wonder who's to blame for that. Are you following me? So I'm saying there's a lot of things that goes into God guiding human beings. You know, and you know, I think he takes all of that into consideration. That's that's what I that's what I get from reading the Quran. But that's a whole other argument. And a lot of people disagree with me, but you know, I, I I'm gonna write more about that in the future, and I've written about it in the past. But great question. I hope I answered it okay. Thank you. Yes. Conversion experience was um, a rational conversion, meaning an intellectual conversion, <coughs> only, like with the influence of the Quran only, or because it didn't seem to me that it was a relational conversion, meaning through the influence of friends or marriage or traveling to an Islamic uh, Muslim country. So, just to conclude that. That's a very good question. I often thought about it. Uh, you know, I think the relational element had something to play. I mean, I really, really love those people. I still do. You know, I think it, that human element is very important. I mean, even though Mahmoud took me to bars and things like that. <laughs> no, no, seriously. He was one of the most generous, kind. But you took me back to the mosque. Yeah, I think he came back to the mosque. But he was a deeply spiritual person. You know, he was just a wayward kid. But I saw in him something, and his family. Something beyond this, you know, the wild life they were living. You know, there was a spirituality there. There was a beauty there. 
that was somehow the basis of your liberty. That was, there was that personal element. Without that personal element, I don't think, maybe I needed somebody like that. If the imam of the message came up and started talking to me, I probably, I'm sure I would have said, thanks, but no. <laughs> you know, sometimes it takes somebody a little closer to you, you know, to help you along. Uh, but, but, you know, I would describe, as far as the crime goes, the experience this way. It began very much rationally and ended very much spiritually. You know, there was a, a spiritual connection that developed there towards the end. I, that, that was unexpected. So, a relational element played a role, began primarily as an intellectual curiosity in my reading the Quran, then became an intellectual compulsion, and then became a very powerful spiritual experience. That's the best that I could, that's my best guess. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. rationalize the obligations um, of, of Islam on a Muslim to practice, such as prayer and fasting. How, how, why wouldn't one just be um, a good person and try to get closer to God through being merciful and generous? And why was there the need for, for obligations? Oh, why the need for all that? Oh, that takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually another lecture. Last about 45 minutes. Could you just invite me up here again? <laughs> I, I'm happy to talk about it. The long and the short of it is, is that uh, I don't know if I could do this quickly because I haven't prepared this in my mind. In my mind. Uh, I've, but I've given this lecture many times. I just can't do, a short, do it in a short, short couple minutes. You know, I'm so, I'm, honestly, my mind is sort of shut off from tiredness. You know, it's been a long two days. But if you read my book, <laughs> even angels ask. <laughs> talk about this quite a bit there, but I also have developed some thoughts about it since. You know, I see it even deeper beyond that, but it's just take me, just, you can't seem to do it right now. I'm just tired. You know, sorry about that. Really, I really am. But I'll tell you this, you know, not about the rituals, but you know, when my kids ask me, you know, ask me about it, you know, but why does life have to be, you know, why does it have to be difficult, spiritual growth? You know, why, you know, why does it have to be, why is this the pain thing? You know, I said, well, maybe I'll appreciate it from this level. When I was in play, playing football, you know, my coach used to say to me, used to say to our team, he used to put up on the wall, no pain, no gain. You know, because he said, in order to grow physically as athletes, to become perfect physical specimens, you got to suck. Your muscles are going to hurt. You're going to push yourself. You're going to struggle. You're going to feel bumps and bruises, and your muscles are going to be strained. But you are going to become stronger, more perfect athletes. And when I was in high school, my math teacher used to tell us, mathematics is hard. You've got to be willing to suffer intellectually to grow mathematically. You know, he said, mathematics is the cruelest science. You've got to be willing to throw yourself into it, to start, think about a problem for six, seven days straight. It's true. You know, and go through all that agony. And once you conquer that problem, you will have learned a lot, and you will have grown, he used to say. We never doubted either one of those things. We thought that, yes, intellectual growth requires a certain amount of perseverance and suffering. Athletic growth, physical growth, similarly. In the Quran, it's true for all growth, even spiritual growth. You know, and the prayers, and this is just a little bit out of your question, help prepare us for the growth. It's a lot like, aside from their spiritual content, which could be amazing, but I don't want to talk about that now. Aside from the spiritual content, there's that element of spiritual preparation. You know, a lot like football practice or study of mathematics, sort of parallel to that. Are you following me? Just one example. I mean, do you mind if I give an example? All you tired people. <laughs> Take the prayers, for example, five times daily. Fajr prayer, getting up. When I became a Muslim, the Fajr prayer was at like 4.45 in the morning. And I thought I was a graduate student before that. I never got up to like 11 o'clock. <laughs> now getting up at 4.45 in the morning, wow, I didn't think I could do it. You know, the other prayers I could do, but 4.45 in the morning, I would set my alarm, I'd hit the alarm, go back to sleep. 
you know, day after day, finally I said, I gotta do something about this. So I took three alarm clocks. <laughs> this is no lie. Put one, you can leave anybody that's tired. Put one right by the bed, set it for 4.15. Took another one, midway between the bathroom and on the floor, <laughs> between the bathroom and the bed, 4.30. 4.45, that one was the one I put in the bathroom by the sink. 4.15 would come, hit the, hit the first alarm, fall back to sleep. But now, I'm still in a slight state of wakefulness. 4.30, now I'm a, a little more awake, I get up, crawl over to the, the second clock, hit it on the floor, lie there. <laughs> no lie. Start falling to sleep. I'm right from start. 4.45, the next one goes, pretty smart scheme though. Huh? <laughs> I get up, crawl, go, so I make my way over to that. I have to get up on the sink, hit it, standing up, I'm a little more awake. I figured, wash my face, you know, <laughs> wash my face, do the prayer. I'm doing this day after day after day it was a time in my life when everybody was freaking out because I converted. People were coming up to me, Kansas, Jeff, you're going to lose your job. What are you doing? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? You know, San Francisco could do this to you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, my family, everybody thought I was going berserk. I was under such, I felt like I was under such intense pressure. But I tell you, those five daily prayers, that patch of prayer, day after day after day, I swear, I, I didn't think I was going to make it, but that played a major role. Just the discipline, getting up every morning at 4.45, day after day after day. No wonder why they make army people get up early in the morning. You know, because it trains you to overcome your, your hardships. You know, it trains you to overcome your difficulties. You learn that you can do it if you want, if you force yourself. It was a big, big help. And to tell you the truth, after about three months, I only needed two alarm clocks. <laughs> Seriously. Six months, I was down to one. And, you know, after that, even if I forgot to set the alarm clock, my inner clock was going, I'd almost always wake up anyway. So, you know, it happened. But that's just from that side, the person, because it does teach us, they do teach us perseverance. They teach us many other things as well, but I just thought I would emphasize that one. You know, aside from your amazing <laughs> spiritual content, and spiritual potential, you know. Is that enough, guys? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Lang. Thank you so much for your inspirational story. We really enjoyed it. In mathematical terms, just to fancy your mathematical side, your story was about the uh, travel from meaningless, the meaningless abyss of zero to the meaningful presence of one. And thank you so much for attending. You all will laugh at the right moments. Thank you so much. Now go off and enjoy it. Thank you for coming. <laughs>